Volume 1 Chapter 14 The Forsaken Lands New Lord You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator The light edits by Lord Immortal at the southernmost part of the Coristal Continent, there was a strip of land that acted as a land bridge between the Coristal Continent and the Priestly Continent. Priestly Continent was where the Beast Men had settled. As both continents were connected, the casualties caused by conflicts between beast men and humans were equal in scale with those of the wars fought between humans and demons. While humans and demons would only fight large scale battles every few decades, skirmishes between humans and beast men forces would happen constantly. The fires of war led to an exodus from surrounding regions into one of the five great human empires, the Gabriel Empire, Swordsman Empire. The Empire of Swordsmen, however, denied asylum to the fleeing refugees which led a large number of jobless and desperate people into a life of banditry. There was an abandoned town near the north of the land bridge. The town of Nelson had once been a bustling place but all the residents abandoned it due to the constant raids by the beast men. It was effectively a ghost town now. Currently, on the mud trails outside the town, a party of knights was traveling. There were only a few dozen of them but each member was a female. Their armor and shield were crafted out of a dark dot-hued metal and none of them carried a lance typical of a knight. They were currently escorting a caravan of large horse dot-drawn carriages filled with resources. The leading carriage hoisted the flag of the Church of Light. It looked out of place and was placed very casually as if it was done just for the sake of it. During their travels, there had been many suspicious figures who had followed these knights. It was rather hard not to attract attention with such a large convoy of resources in a region torn by war, especially a convoy that was guarded by female knights. Many bandit gangs had set their eyes on this lucrative target, wanting to take both fortune and the women. None of them realized their errors until it was too late. Bella sat in the leading carriage with the Lolas. Angel, Mia, and Nosha. Eleanor, with her knights, led the front while Dolores rode with the rear guard. Roland acted as the coachwoman with Annie as her companion. I didn't expect this town to be completely free. Bella studied the map of the continent in her hands, feeling rather happy. A bar of gold was equal to a hundred gold coins and was worth more in border towns such as this one. Since it was more convenient to carry than coins, its price was raised by gold dealers to 120 gold coins per bar. That cardinal had given her 20 gold bars. This was enough money for her to buy a decently sized house in the capital of any of the five great empires and still have leftovers for a year of standard living expenses. The church sure has money. While that cardinal didn't seem like a very good person, he sure was open.handed. It would be so nice if I could encounter him again. Bella was reminiscing when the carriage suddenly came to a stop. There seemed to be a commotion outside. What happened? Who are those people? Bella opened the curtains and poked her head out through the carriage's window. She saw a large group of armed men blocking the path ahead of the convoy. This is a robbery. Abandon your carriages and get lost. The head of these bandits, Joseph, had hesitated for a while when he looked at the church's flag on the carriage before finally deciding to throw caution to the wind. They were attempting to rob a convoy that flew the flag of the church, so they would avoid killing as much as possible, or the church might hound them if they crossed their bottom line. Don't you know that we are the church's knights? You dare to try and rob the church. Scram. Roland's intentions were to save the lives of these bandits but it was useless. Not one of them paid attention to what she said and paid dearly for their foolishness. Only two of Bella's knights stepped out to meet the charging bandits, Lady Bella. Can we? To be merciful to one's enemy is to be cruel to oneself. After watching the two knights massacre the bandits, Bella returned to the carriage. The quality of these bandits didn't even require Eleanor to take action. Very few people had the capability to become some of Bella's materials. Joseph's gang didn't hold out for very long before they were completely obliterated, and the convoy continued on. From the carriage's windows, Bella would often see beggars on the sides of the road. 
She did not pay any attention to them as even though the convoy had large amounts of food and water, they did not have enough to feed every beggar. There was also a chance for the situation to go south. Moreover, there were some gangs who would ambush caravans by pretending to be beggars. Bella did not want to take unnecessary risks, they were not the peacekeepers with blue helmets from Earth. Her eyes returned to the map on the table. She had bought the town of Nelson from Duke Victor who owned the land prior, though she didn't pay a single penny for it. The Duke's wrinkled face had immediately lit up when he learned that Bella wanted to purchase the abandoned town. It was as if he wanted to get rid of the hot potato in his hands. He also gave large swathes of the desolate lands around the town itself. She wanted to give him several gold bars in payment, but he refused after seeing her missionary certificate. He offered the town as a gift to the church and wouldn't accept any money even if Bella had beaten him to death. Bella picked up the certificate lying beside the map and studied it. The words on it were the same as the one that Stanley had given her, the only difference being a tiny red mark at the bottom left corner that looked like the thumbnail of a magic formation. Sister, this is a ritual array for summoning demons from other worlds. It's just a beginner level array, however, there are much more complex ones out there. After learning the meaning behind the symbol, Bella was more puzzled. Why would a certificate from the Church of Light have something like this on it? Bella decided that she would ponder about this later since the current priority was to settle in the new town. Bella didn't think about looking for revenge against Leisha. She did not want to get involved with any more reincarnators after she faked her death at Enola Clark Strip. Therefore, she chose a place far away from Octavian Empire, Knight's Empire, to expand and develop. Count Harold was not implicated by the disappearance of Eleanor and Sidney. Most likely, he had made some sort of deal with the church for sanctuary. It seemed that the church's authority was greater than what Bella previously thought. Underscore 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 after exterminating over a dozen bandit gangs, there weren't any more bandits left who dared to look for trouble. Maybe the news about the incident had spread through the region and deterred any other bandit gang from setting their eyes on it. Humph, these bandits won't be around for much longer. Bella's convoy entered the deserted town of Nelson and headed straight for the church in the center of the town. Bella planned to continue hoisting the flag of the church and decided to set up her new base here. You girls can put that box over there. All right, you're all dismissed for now. Bella directed her knights to carry a large box into the center of the church then followed the instructions that Mystica had given her to undo the box's magical seal. The box turned into dust soon after the seal was broken. A large and dark thing that looked like a massively enlarged human's brain was left behind. It looked alive with the flow of blood visible on the giant organ. This was something called Devil's Wisdom, also known to some as Demon Brain. It was one of the more important things that Mystica had given to Bella. The Devil's Wisdom was a living thing and had its own intellect. Its main purpose was to grant greater wisdom to higher tier monsters. It could also command all the monsters within a very large radius. It was one of the must-dot-haves for running a dark realm. After the demon's wisdom appeared, it immediately gave off a weird aura that encased the church within a blink of an eye. Bella and the others weren't affected by it at all. This aura did not cause any harm to females, most likely because its previous owner, Mystica, was also a female. Eleanor, bring in the box that holds the demon's heart as well. I want to rebuild my dark kingdom here. Understood, Lady Bella. Bella planned to rebuild her dark kingdom in this region. She would first revive all the cadre-level monsters who had sacrificed themselves for her in Enola Clark Strip. This time, she had learned the true way to create monsters from Mystica, it was about time she put it into practice. Outside the church, Roland and Annie had mixed feelings as they looked at the happenings inside the church. They were currently the only humans left in Bella's party as Eleanor and her Night Corp had already accepted a demon. God's power and could no longer be considered human. They were currently witnessing the rise of a new dark kingdom and had some very complicated feelings about this as they were still human. Underscore 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 a month after Bella arrived, 
an army of over a thousand mounted soldiers approached the outskirts of Nelson Town. Although they rode warhorses, their armor was lighter than the heavy plate armor of knights. This wasn't a mercenary guild since they flew the flag of Gabriel Empire, swordsmen. Ivy, something feels off about this town, I can't put my finger on it but I think we should remain cautious. Susan, didn't Duke Victor say that someone from your church had built a church here then why are you so nervous? Those who built the church here are from the Salo faction, they don't get along well with the Allen faction that I am part of. I don't get what's with the church. You guys represent one faith but are split into three factions. Oh well, let's continue. Elena Ivy was a daughter of the head of the Ignaz family, one of the Gabriel Empire's, swordsmen, three great families. Ivy had come to this dangerous region in order to hunt monsters. Her good friend, the Church of Light's third holy maiden, Antonia Susan, accompanied her. In Coristal Continent, the supply of magic cores found in monsters could never keep up with the demand. The magic cores of lower-level monsters were already selling like hot cakes, not to mention higher-level monsters whose cores were sold at an astronomical price and one might not even be able to buy it with gold. In this region that connected the two continents, there was a massive monster dot infested forest. As it was unnamed, people just called it the unnamed forest. There were tales of terrifyingly powerful monsters that were hidden in this forest. Although no one was able to confirm whether these terrifying beasts actually existed, the mercenaries who lived to tell the tale brought news that there were already high tiered monsters merely on the outskirts. It was hard to tell what kinds of existences might be deeper within as either none who dared to venture far in had returned alive or they didn't wish to talk about their experiences. Susan, are you really not going to visit your colleague? You are part of the same church, after all. It might be rude to not greet them. It's fine Ivy, the Salo faction always liked performing all sorts of mysterious rituals. If we run into them in the middle of some weird ritual then. Ivy and Susan bypassed Nelson Town, heading towards the unnamed forest. They found it rather strange to have not run into a single bandit, not even a scout. This region had been notorious for banditry, but now they were nowhere to be seen. Had they all turned a new leaf in their lives? As the region was fraught with dangers, ordinary mercenary groups wouldn't take commissions for this region. This place was directly connected to the land of the beastmen and wars between them and humans were common. There was a possibility that they could be ambushed by beastmen armies at any time, making commissions in this region that much pricier. As for higher ranking mercenary groups, their commission price was too high and Ivy didn't want to spend any unnecessary money. Instead, she used her family's power to obtain a regiment of guards to assist them. On the forest's path, Ivy and Susan finally saw living people. There was a small wooden shack on the side of the road. Outside the shack were three little girls huddled around a table playing a card game that they didn't recognize. The little girls all wore gothic Lolita dresses that were beautifully designed. It was their first time seeing such clothes. The church's cross. The three of them are members of the church. Even from a distance, Susan could see the dark silver crosses that hung around the necks of the three Lolas. Although the color of the crosses was a bit different, they were definitely the ones that the church's sisters had to wear. One thing that threw Susan off somewhat was that the girls did not wear the garb of a sister which should have been customary. Near the three little girls were ten mountless female knights in black armor standing at attention. On each of their arms was a strip of cloth with an insignia representing their identities. The insignia of the Salo faction. These are the Salo faction's people. Susan saw the insignia on the arms of the Black Knights and hesitated. Her faction had never seen eye to eye with the Salo faction. While they might be able to control their temper in big cities due to the large number of onlookers, there was no telling what might happen in a secluded place like this. Susan, look at the pile on their table. Am I dreaming? Tracing Ivy's shocked gaze, Susan also looked at the table and froze. The tabletop was filled with magic cores of multiple colors, evidently belonging to monsters of all elements. 
many of them also had the gleam that only the high-tiered monsters had. Each of the Lolas had a pile of magic cores in front of her. Even more shocking were the numerous large burlap bags casually strewn at the feet of the Lolas. As their mouths were not closed, they could see the magic cores within. The army that Ivy had brought was stupefied as well. Even the dumbest of them knew the value of all these magic cores. If it wasn't for Ivy and Susan, many of them would have already charged at them to snatch as many as they could before fleeing. There were only three sisters and ten female knights guarding them, they wouldn't have cared whether they were robbing the church or not. If they could escape the church's hunting, they would be able to live the rest of their lives in comfort. Ivy and Susan exchanged looks. The two of them gestured for the guards to stay where they were and walked towards the wooden shack. Halt, who? Outsider. This is not somewhere you should be. A female knight in black armor intercepted them, barely managing to swallow the words, human. I am the church's third holy maiden, Antonia Susan. Can you let me see those sisters over there? While speaking, Susan took out and showed the cross that was the proof of her identity as a holy maiden of the Church of Light to the female knight that blocked their way. Even though the Salo faction didn't get along with her Allen faction, she still had a cavalry of thousands at her command. Susan couldn't determine the cultivation of the ten female knights. However, since they guarded such a fortune in a place notorious for bandits, even without their mounts, they were probably at least at the level of a holy knight. You too can. As for the others, especially the males, they're not allowed or. Susan and Ivy didn't understand why males couldn't go while females could. The cavalry that acted as bodyguards for the two were fuming. They felt their dignity being tread upon by her words. They would definitely let the knight have a piece of their mind if they had received the order to do so from Susan or Ivy. Airplane. This round is my definitely my win. 1. You're too naive angel, bomb. 2. I'm sorry Mia, but I win this round, rocket. 3. Dot. I'll get you in the next round. I want to raise the stakes by threefold. As Mia was talking, Nosha took the small pile of magic cores at the center of the table and placed them in the pile beside her. Afterwards, she placed another small pile at the center. When Nosha turned around, she saw the petrified Ivy and Susan. Do you sisters want to play landlord as well? You two don't seem to have any chips with you, I can lend you some if you want. TL, one, two or more three dot of dot a dot kinds in a row, 444,555 etc. Two, the four of a kind, three, big and small jokers, the highest hand in landlord. Volume 1 Chapter 15 Pilgrims of the Dark Country You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator The light edits by Lord Immortal Although Susan and Ivy had never heard of a game called Landlord, but based on the strange cards in the Lola's hands, as well as the resemblance of their setup with the Empire's casinos, they could infer that the tree Lola's had been gambling. Members of the clergy aren't allowed to gamble. Um, we're playing with stones not gold. I don't think this goes against regulations, Sister Priestess. Susan didn't know how to respond to Angel's innocent smile. While the church did have regulations that banned members of the clergy from gambling, that was only limited to coinage. There was no official regulation which stated that one could not gamble with magic cores. Little sisters, why don't you treasure these precious magic cores? They're scattered so casually. Are these stones really that hard to find? We have so many of these, there are some more piles over there, and there too. Ivy felt heartache for the precious magic cores worth fortunes but were being treated as mere stones. She was about to urge the Lolas to cherish their wealth but after following the direction that Mia had pointed out to her, the words stuck in her throat. It turned out that the entire wooden shack was filled with a pile of magic cores taller than a man and had started to spill out of the half-open door. It seemed that Mia wasn't wrong when she said that magic cores weren't hard to find. These. Magic cores. Where did you girls find them from? Our elder sisters brought them back for us to play with. Do you want to play or not? 
The offer from earlier still stands. If you don't want to play, we're going to continue Ia, Big Sis has returned. No Shaw was about to return to the game but stood up in happiness when she saw the familiar figures appearing in the distance. Ivy and Susan followed the Lola's line of sight and found three girls about their own age clad in knight's plate armor heading slowly towards the shack. It was easy to tell from their helmet dot less faces that each of them was a beauty. These three knights were also mount dot less and wore the same dark armor and silver cross as the knights who had been guarding the shack previously. The only difference being their armors which had an elaborate golden trim, making them much more noticeable than the guard knights. Their positions were most likely higher as well. What surprised Ivy and Susan the most was that each of three knights carried a large bag on their backs, the knight with the golden dot blonde hair seemed to be carrying the biggest and heaviest of the three. The trio ignored the petrified Ivy and Susan and placed their bags near the three Lolas. The bags weren't closed properly and some of the magic cores spilled out when the knights placed them on the ground. Many of the magic cores still had fresh monster blood, it was obvious where they came from. Apart from the sound of the three Lolas happily digging through the newly arrived magic cores, there was absolute silence. The thousand dot men guard of Ivy and Susan was collectively frozen in shock. All of these magic cores were still fresh, this meant that these three mysterious female knights from the church had just slaughtered a huge number of monsters. This was already beyond the realm of holy knights. These three knights could very well be dragon knights with that kind of strength. Bella was laughing internally as she observed the terrified onlookers. She had finally experienced the exhilarating feeling of showing off and putting on airs like the MCs from Earth's light novels. If it wasn't for these two beauties, Bella would have already slaughtered their guards. There were already several powerful evil creatures lying in ambush. It was just that the cavalry was too weak to sense them. Can you introduce yourself, my friend? I am the church's third holy maiden, Antonia Susan. This here is my good friend, Elena Ivy of the Ignaz family from the Gabriel Empire, swordsman. Susan gave a courteous greeting to Bella. She thought it was good to lower herself a bit while talking with someone who most likely had attained the realm of a dragon knight. She didn't want to unintentionally offend the other side. I'm an insignificant knight named Bella, Nelson Town's guardian knight. Oh, those two are also guardian knights. One is Dolores and the other is Eleanor. Seeing that Dolores and Eleanor had no intentions to introduce themselves, Bella decided to do it for them. Ivy and Susan carefully studied Eleanor, the guardian knight with fiery dot red hair. If they remembered correctly, there was a young lady of a prestigious family from the Octavian Empire, Knights, with the same name. Was it just a coincidence? After all, they had never seen Eleanor in person, only having heard of her name being mentioned before. As Eleanor didn't choose to speak, it wouldn't be very courteous for them to ask. Ivy wore light armor that was pure dot white and carried a finely crafted sword. Her flowing hair and irises were all dark dot brown. Bella felt a sort of nostalgia and intimacy as Ivy looked very much like an Asian, the first one that Bella had seen in this world. It might be a result of training with the sword but Ivy's body was especially thin, but she was absolutely not lacking in the chest department. Bella wondered how she maintained her beautiful pale skin while training. Susan and Ivy's heights were about the same as that of Roland and Annie's, just a bit shorter than Dolores, Eleanor, and Bella. Susan's attire was similar to that of the second holy maiden Haley whom Bella had met just recently. The only difference between the two was that while Haley's hair was snow dot white, Susan's was the more traditional golden dot blonde. On Susan's right shoulder, Bella saw the emblem consisting of a pure dot white hexagram, the same as the second holy maiden, Haley. From what Bella had learned since her encounter with Haley, this emblem represented Alan Faction, one of the three factions within the Church of Light. The cardinal who had given her the box of gold bars was the head of the Salo faction and the two factions had never seen eye to eye. Hopefully, Susan wasn't looking for trouble. Susan was able to see the cautiousness in Bella's eyes but chose not to speak about it. 
their factions had already been in a state of infighting for the past few thousand years, after all. From churches to the territories in each city, there had been constant fighting between the two factions and it was hard to resolve the tensions between both sides. Susan didn't know that Bella wasn't actually a member of the Salo faction. She was just a fake who was using the Salo faction as a disguise and the same could be said for every other member of the Salo faction here. As the Salo faction had always been cruel and brutal to heretics, there weren't very many people that dared to imitate a member of the Salo faction. It was pure luck that Susan and Ivy had run into Bella's group of imposters. Lady Bella, about these magic cores, we picked them up on the path. If you need to get somewhere, I suggest you do so before the sun sets. We'll be returning to Nelson for worshipping. Bella whispered into Noesha's ear who then went up to the shack and gestured with her hands, and all the magic cores in the shack vanished into thin air as if they had never even existed. If it wasn't for Bella and the others who were still here, Susan and Ivy would have considered their entire encounter a dream. Space.Time Magic Little sister, are you a space.time magician? I'm just a normal sister of the church. You two sisters take care. I'm heading back to Nelson Town with big sister Bella and others. As they saw Bella's group was about to leave, Ivy finally remembered the reason why they had intercepted Bella in the first place and hurriedly blocked their path. Lady Ivy, we still have stuff to attend to. Why are you blocking our way? I need the magic core of a high dot level monster. Unfortunately, I didn't bring enough helpers so I want to enlist your help. When we finish, you can ask the church for payment. State your price. Um, what monster are you hunting? A. Hey wait, Bella, don't go. Can we at least discuss the price? As soon as she heard that the two were hunting ground dragons, Bella had wanted to leave on the spot. Although ground dragons were pseudo-dot-dragons, they were still technically considered dragon kin and were much stronger than typical high-dot-level monsters. At the Adventurer's Guild, hunting ground dragons was already considered a low-dot-level dragon-dot-slaying assignment. There weren't many who had completed a mission of this class in the entire history of the Adventurer's Guild. Along with the fact that Bella still had some bad memories of being beaten senseless by Leisha's golden dragon just recently, it made her all the more not want to encounter another dragon. Hey, don't leave. I can give whatever amount of money you want for payment. Does it look like we're the type of people who lack money, boss? I still want to live a few more years. A ground dragon already can't be considered a high dot level monster. You'd best find someone else to help you with your dragon dot slaying mission. Isn't it the church's way to help people in need, Bella? Why area? Oh please, that's the saying of your Alan faction, I'm from the Salo faction. Susan studied Bella's group curiously with her golden irises. Those who could kill so many monsters wouldn't be weak, they should definitely have the ability to kill a ground dragon. It was very interesting to Susan that such a powerful person would be so scared as soon as she heard about them planning to kill her out of curiosity and playfulness, Susan decided to drag Bella down with her on this dragon. Slaying Task At this moment, Susan had forgotten the conflict between their factions and had not yet realized that the one who would truly be dragged down in the future would be herself. I know you don't lack money but I really need your help. I'll owe you a huge favor, and if you ever need help, I will do everything I can within my jurisdiction. Hearing Ivy's words, Eleanor and Dolores made an unnatural expression, Eleanor especially so. Eleanor quickly turned to the side, looking as if she wanted to laugh but managing not to. Weren't those the same words she had said to Bella just a month ago? It was shocking how history repeats itself. Bella's gaze suddenly sharpened as she stopped in her tracks. Recalling properly, the last one who had said these words to her already had half a meter of grass above their grave. Er, wrong phrase. They had already joined Bella's side. This ivy was definitely a swordswoman. It wasn't a bad idea to get such a beautiful swordswoman on her side. All right, we can offer our assistance but it's getting late. By the time we enter the forest, it'll be too dark to see anything. 
we can gather here tomorrow, it's best if you return. Can we stay in Nelson Town tonight, seeing as we're part of the same church? Pretty please. Sure but only the two of you. The town can't hold too many people. This is non-negotiable. If you can't accept it then I wish you a safe journey back to your camp. Bella quickly shut Susan down before she could ask for anything else. She didn't know why but she had trouble denying Susan's requests. Perhaps it was because of the contrast. Acting Mo, different from her usual holy maiden role. Underscore 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 the guards who had escorted Ivy and Susan returned the way they had come from under the command of Ivy. They were rather confused when they left. The Church of Light Salo and Allen factions had never gotten along, this was fairly well known, but now the Allen faction's holy maiden was about to spend a night at a Salo faction church. Had the two factions decided to band together to face the threat of the newer third faction? Sadly, this gossip wouldn't be brought back into the human territory. The guards had been ambushed on their way back by a raiding party of beastmen numbering almost 20,000. Ivy and Susan managed to dodge a bullet by choosing to stay the night at Nelson Town. Underscore 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 on their way back, Susan and Ivy couldn't believe what they were seeing. Before coming, they had heard from Duke Victor that the town of Nelson had been destroyed during the fight with the beast men. However, the town's fields were brimming with green crops as far as the eye could see and based on their growth, it was safe to assume that they had been planted for a while. But the most shocking thing for them was that these crops weren't even planted by humans, Susan and Ivy didn't know what to say as they looked at the zombies toiling away in the fields. Has this world gone mad? It was unheard of for the zombies, who would only attack humans, to work in the fields. As they continued their scrutiny, Ivy and Susan discovered quite a bit of difference between these zombies and those that only knew how to blindly attack humans. These zombies did not have any open wounds and had all of their limbs. Apart from the unmoving eyes and lack of breathing, there weren't any apparent differences between them and normal humans. The zombies were very strong and worked very hard. Along with the fact that they didn't need to eat, they made the best workers for large projects. They were similar to Earth's machines but had a significant advantage over them, it was that machines would eventually break down due to overuse. These zombies could work for centuries or even millennia as they would never malfunction like machines and never rest. The closer they got to the town, the more shocked Ivy and Susan became. There were even more zombies inside the town itself, and they could be seen working busily everywhere. If it wasn't for the fact that they neither breathed nor moved their eyes, it would have felt as if they had entered a busy human city. The zombies didn't talk amongst themselves and continued their work even when Bella's group of living humans entered the town. They did, however, open up a path for them to pass. Bella, what's with these zombies? Why is it that they don't attack humans, they seem to have quite a bit of intelligence. Looking at the zombies who were busy building the city, Susan asked a little nervously. These zombies didn't only do hard labor, but they also seemed to be doing work that required a certain level of intellect. No one would believe Bella if she said that these zombies didn't have any intelligence. This is one of our Salo faction secrets, Miss Holy Maiden, therefore, I suggest you stop asking. All you need to know is that these zombies won't attack you. Just pretend as if they are nothing but air. Bella chose not to explain anymore. She had learned quite a bit about the Salo faction during this past month. The Salo faction was one of the three big factions within the church. Its head was Cardinal Andrew Salo who had gifted Bella the box of gold previously. This faction valued using the evil power of demons to maintain the power of the church, quite opposite to the church's preaching. But if there weren't any evil beings creating havoc, there would be no need of the church and fewer people would follow their faith. This was something that the Pope didn't want to see. So he let the Salo faction off the hook in silent acquiescence, even going as far as using their cruel means to crush those who dared to oppose the church. The Salo faction was also used as an important chess piece to keep the Allen faction in check. 
Seeing that Bella didn't wish to continue the topic, Susan couldn't exactly persist with her questions. She was aware of the tensions within the church. While the factions would beat each other up at home, they still had to present a united front to outsiders. The Allen faction had long known of the evil rituals performed by the Salo faction, but the Pope had turned a deaf ear to the Allen faction's complaints. After such a long time, the Allen faction could basically guess the reasons behind the Pope's inaction. Bella had let the two girls stay the night because she was confident that Susan would not tell anyone what she saw here. Moreover, Ivy still had something that needed her help. She should know better to keep quiet. Moreover, there was something else that she had not told the two. The zombies created by coming in contact with the fluid secreted by Thea. Demons with Doma. could also attack humans. It was just that they wouldn't attack females, also the reason why Bella only allowed Susan and Ivy inside the city. Nelson was technically no longer a town. Its scale was already comparable to a large dot scale city, and zombies were still working day and night to construct various structures. It would only be a matter of time before the city grew to the size of an empire's capital. Beside the fields were many large grain silos. Each was so filled to the brim with various cereals that the doors had difficulties closing. Next to the silos, there were also zombies hurriedly constructing several new silos as well as a never-ending stream of zombies carrying sacks of grain into the silos. Bella, have you ever thought about helping to feed the refugees with all this food? If you did so, it would definitely improve the current situation in the region. I haven't, Miss Holy Maiden. Do you think that humans would be willing to eat food that was grown by zombies? Volume 1 Chapter 16 Secrets Below the Great Church You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator The light edits by Kenny The central parts of Nelson had already been refurbished to look like a newly built city by the zombies. However, what made this city strange was the fact that it was not inhabited by humans, but rather the zombies who made no sound. To some, the city could be considered as a perfect location to make a horror movie. In the city stood a luxurious villa whose beauty was second to only the grand church that was built out of pure dot white stone. This villa was very extravagant, not to mention its large size, there was also installments such as a pool and hot dot tubs. Currently, Bella and the others were relaxing in the open dot air pool which was located on the second floor. Aside from Eleanor, Dolores, Dolores, Roland, Annie, and the three Lolas, Bella had also invited Ivy and Susan as guests to the pool party. Bella had based this pool on a certain country from Earth's marina sands, its level of luxurious wasn't any lower than any other recreation facility in this world. Bella, these clothes. Aren't they a little too revealing? Ivy looked at the black three-dot point bikini that Bella made her wear. Susan, on the other hand, looked completely nonchalant and was leaning on the side of the pool in a golden bikini. It seemed that this holy maiden was pretty open, at least more open than Ivy. You have a nice body Ivy, what's there to be shy about? We are all girls here, and there aren't any outsiders either. Anyway, isn't this more comfortable than what you were wearing before? Ivy looked around and saw that all the other girls in the pool were wearing similarly styled bikinis, and thought that it might be wrong for her to be so sensitive. After thinking for a while, she decided that she would relax with the only familiar person here, Susan. Bella was casually sitting on a floating pool chair and was calmly enjoying the view, this was a treatment that only two. D protagonists from Earth were able to enjoy. She hadn't expected to get this treatment in another world, it was even more satisfying to Bella because all the swimsuits that the girls were wearing were designed by her. A crooked smile stealthily crept onto Bella's face as she observed the curious Susan and the shy Ivy, these two girls had nice bodies. Ivy was on the thin side while Susan was rather more curvaceous, her chest was already on the same scale as of Dolores' chest. As they've already put on the clothes that she designed, Bella didn't plan to let these two escape her clutches. Elder sister, your evil thoughts are leaking from your eyes, are you plotting to obtain the two new sisters? Nosha, who was wearing a pink swimsuit, 
sat beside Bella on the floating chair. This chair had a rather large surface area and it could hold the two girls without any trouble. No Shaw wasn't wearing a three-dot point bikini, but rather a normal design that exposed less. Despite the fact Noesha's chest size wasn't small at all, Bella wanted to keep true to her lowly attributes so she made No Sha a cute lowly bikini that was similar in style with Mia and Angel's bikini. Bella also made another three of the same design for the three lowly creator gods. After everything settled down, Bella had planned to invite those three creators to come and play, as thanks for their help. Little No Sha, I'm a kind and innocent person, don't go around spouting random rumors about me. A good girl must be elegant, not naughty. Elder sis, you really are. I'm going back to reading. No Sha then returned her focus to the 18x dojin in her hands. Bella didn't know what to say about this little sister of hers who never forgot to bring her arrow dot books wherever she went. Apart from just reading them all by herself, she also acted as a missionary to convince others to read the dujins as well. The first ones to receive her preachings were Mia and Angel. As the dujins that No Sha promoted were all Yuri. oriented, along with her agenda, Bella didn't stop No Sha from doing so. It didn't take long for the sun to set below the horizon, and darkness to creep over the region again. The town was well lit, most likely because of the zombies who lit their lights like humans. Even if they didn't have any light, zombies would still be able to work normally. After all, they were as good as blind. They were probably just following their instinctive memory from when they were still humans. Can you take us for a tour of your convent later, Bella? Holy maidens, our convent isn't open to the outside. Clergy not from the Salo faction. Just call me Susan. You don't have to be so formal with me. Are you really from the Salo faction, Bella? You don't seem like one of those shady heretics who only know how to summon evil stuff. Don't joke with me like that, Susan. I was sent by Cardinal Salo here himself, how can I not be a part of the Salo faction? Are you questioning my loyalty to Lord Salo? Bella gave a plausible excuse, she didn't have to take responsibility for her words, however, she did receive a certificate from the Cardinal himself. Bella, I heard from Mia that you were the one that designed all these clothes. They are my designs, do you like them Ivy? I designed these swimwears and underwears from the sizes of the other girls present here, there are a lot more clothing for the girls on the hangers over there. Bella proudly pointed at the rows of clothes not too far away from the pool. Several transparent dot looking ghost dot maids had already brought the clothes for the girls to change into. The styles varied and all were designed by Bella and sewn by the ghost dot maids who Bella had personally trained. Apart from helping Bella make these clothes, the ghost dot maids also carry out their daily duties of the villa, while also providing the service for the upper echelons of Nelson Town. These ghost dot maids weren't just for decoration either, they were very high dot powered undead type magic beings. The probability of becoming a ghost dot made from a ghost was 1 in 10,000. Currently, however, there were no conflicts or intruders so these ghost maids acted like regular ghosts, for now. Why don't you join the Allen faction, Bella? One of the three cardinals, Anthony Allen, is my mentor, I can introduce you to him, he is a very nice person. This is a matter of principle Susan, I must deny. Cardinal Andrew Salo is my sponsor. The reason behind Susan persuading Bella to shift allegiances to the Allen faction was because of the large amounts of grains in her hands, and food supplies were an important political piece in regions affected by war. If they used the Allen faction's name to give out food to refugees, they would unquestionably be able to get large amounts of support from the lower classes. It's getting late and we still have to go monster dot hunting tomorrow. Oh, you can pick any of these clothes, they're free to use. Susan had wanted to try convincing Bella some more, but Ivy had already been dragged away by No Sha and the other Lolas to pick out clothes. She didn't have any choice but to follow them. Bella, Dolores, and Eleanor left the villa with Roland and Annie and were headed towards the Grand Church. 
various fearsome dot looking evil beings had begun to wander the streets with the zombies, these evil beings would normally only come out at night as these evil beings were different from the zombies in the regard that they would attack humans regardless of their gender. Looking at all the evil beings that made a way for them, Bella was glad that she didn't allow Susan and Ivy to follow them out. These evil beings were very sensitive to demon kings and had sensed the presence of Bella as soon as they had left the villa. Roland and Annie were also spared as they had the imprint that identified them as a demon king's exclusive subordinates. Underscore 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 there weren't any icons of the God of Light or anything else related to God in the Grand Church. The statue at the center of the church was that of a lowly with a veiled face, it was a statue of dark creator Mystica, Bella had this statue erected here with the permission from the creator herself. This church was just a font, the real core of the town was the dark sanctuary deep below the church. The dark sanctuary was Bella's base for monsters that she had built, emulating Mystica's dark dimension. Although she based it off of Mystica's dimension, there were several differences. Mystica's Demon King Hall had twelve High Demon King thrones, and only High Demon Kings had the right to enter while normal Demon Kings could only wait outside. Bella's Dark Sanctuary did not have any High Demon Kings, so it had only twelve normal Demon King thrones. Mystica had promised Bella four High Demon King thrones, but they were currently under construction and it would take a while before they were delivered. One thing though, Bella had tried out the High Demon King throne but felt as if Felia's Demon King body was completely unable to control it, she didn't know how strong a Demon King had to be in order to qualify for a High Demon King if even Felia, who had received blood from three demon and evil gods, couldn't. At the center of the Dark Sanctuary was the Holy Land of the Evil Beings, the Demon King's Hall. The hall was designed like an emperor's palace, but instead of the emperor's throne, there were twelve demon king thrones where the emperor's throne was supposed to be. Each of these demon king thrones was in a different style, but all adhered to the theme of darkness. The twelve thrones were arranged in a semicircle, facing in, and each had a slot for a sword on the back of the throne. Currently, all twelve swords were present, these swords were exclusive to the demon king that used the throne affiliated with the sword. These thrones were not fixed to the ground, but floating slightly above the floor. The floating thrones increased the Demon King's style points immensely. At the center of the semicircle was a giant crimson heart, the Demon's Heart, it had many tubes sprouting out of it that entered the ground, and the floor of the hall was crisscrossed with what seemed to be barely visible veins and arteries, still with blood inside that moved with the beat of the massive heart. Behind the twelve thrones, a giant brain floated, and it had almost completely transparent arteries that were only visible around the brain itself, Bella did not know the extent of these arteries as they were not visible. There were already an enormous amount of evil beings gathered around the hall, Bella estimated at least 10,000 from what she could see. Each one of the evil beings kneeled on the ground, looking up at the demon kings below the demon's wisdom. At the very front of those evil beings were several hundred human dot shaped evil beings, they only kneeled with one knee, their position was higher than those behind them. These were all personally created by Bella with material from the demon's wisdom and demon's heart, it would be catastrophic if any of these evil beings were to be unleashed on the society. Dot, hail Prime King, hail Heavenly King, hail Blood King, all of you may rise, is there anything to report? Dolores acted with familiarity, she was originally a demon princess after all and had seen her father receiving the empire's nobles, she was only imitating her father right now. Bella sat the throne in the center with Dolores to her left and Eleanor to her right. Roland and Annie wore Bella's specially designed demon king made attire and stood to the side of the thrones, Roland beside Eleanor and Annie beside Bella. Bella, Dolores, and Eleanor had switched into demon king's garb. As they were wearing the female style and they were all good dot looking girls, the three of them looked more like demon princesses than as demon kings. Each one of them wore a differently styled crown that gave off a monarch's vibe, Bella's was dark gold while Eleanor and Dolores were blood red and platinum respectively. Eleanor's tensely held a bone cup, the endless ripples made in the dark red tea showed the unrest of its holder. Although Eleanor was born into one of the Octavian empires, knights, for great families, 
she had never seen such a scene before. Bella sniggered as she looked at the tense Eleanor, this girl needed some more practice, they would most likely have to see this kind of scene many more times in the future. Heavenly King, I and my subordinates obtained a large number of precious minerals from the mine and wished to erect statues in honor of the demon kings who created us and this dark sanctuary, and are here to seek permission from demon kings. Bella had modified these evil beings' memories so that they would remember that their creator was Bella's true form, and Philia was just one of her subordinate demon kings. This would eliminate many unnecessary problems and a double identity would also be more flexible. As for the identities of Angel, Mia, and Nosha, Bella didn't hide anything from the monsters and they treated the three Lolas as demon gods. I represent all the demon kings present and give you my permission, thank you for your hard work, Malz. After receiving a nod from Bella, Dolores gave Hell's Warden Malz the permission to carry out the crafting and erecting of the statues. Hell's Warden Malz was the new Warden Malz after the original had been destroyed by Berserker Barths at the decisive battle several months ago using the Pillar of the War God, the current Malz was much stronger than he was during that battle. Demon Kings, your subordinate has cleared out several more bandit groups during the period since we were last gathered here. I have brought all the loots that have been liberated from their camps, and brought them here to offer as the tribute. Nicely done, Clement. You're living up to your name as Master of Faces. I thank the appreciation of the Demon Kings, this is what we, as your subordinates, are supposed to do. Bone, corroding Duke Adrian helped me with the extermination of these bandits, he also deserves some credit. The other humanoid monsters looked jealousy at Clement, even though he wasn't very powerful, but his disguising ability was way too broken and would often disguise as a human to gather intel in the human towns and this time he had brought back several dozen boxes full of loot as the tribute to the demon kings. Even Prime King, who has never spoken before, had praised him, along with Blood King who had been out of it until now. It infuriated them to look at Clement's mocking smile, if he didn't have bone, corroding Duke Adrian backing him up, he would have been beaten to death after everyone was dismissed. Clement didn't give any response to the countless killing gazes behind him. Anyway, the monsters Bella personally created wouldn't completely die unless both the demon's wisdom and demon's heart were destroyed simultaneously. Clement's creed was that if he can't die, he didn't have to care for the opinions of the others, apart from a certain few, of course. Demon kings, this is the intel I have gathered from the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, at Prime King's request. Gabriel Empire, swordsman, also has several people that could potentially be troublesome, could I implore demon kings on what our next course of action would be? After receiving the thick stack of papers that Annie delivered to her, Bella froze after looking at the first page. Why was this person's backstory so similar to that of Leisha's, also another case of someone rapidly gaining power after an event? There was the possibility that she was another transmigrator and that there were more than two transmigrators in this world. Volume 1 Chapter 17 Danger. Tower defense in the abandoned city you are listening at novel full audio. Translator. The light edits by Lord Immortal the Alva Duchy was originally just another ordinary land owned by an ordinary duke. It was only known because of its location between the border of humans and beast men, being a place where the two sides often clashed. Against the stronger physiques of the beast men, Human soldiers had to rely mainly on superior equipment to have any hope at achieving victory. Another saving grace was that typical beast men usually had a low aptitude for magic, and human mages were unmatched by their beast men counterpart in battle if properly protected. However, the Alva Plains where the duchy was situated had one big problem. The soil here was too loose. The loose soil made it impossible to make strong fortifications, and the humans were not able to build a wall tall enough without it collapsing. This was the reason why the Alva Duchy had been abandoned by the five empires, it would be too costly to defend against the invading beast men without proper fortifications. Also, the human empires were still battling the demon forces in the north and were unable to send any decent reinforcements such as dragon knights to the duchy. After all, there was next to no value in reinforcing a duchy whose only resource was farmland. 
The entire duchy consisted only of its capital while a typical duchy would have several satellite cities around its capital and other smaller settlements scattered throughout. The Alva Duchy did used to have satellite cities at one point but they were destroyed in recent years by the newly renewed Beastmen onslaught. To concentrate forces and make it easier to defend, the feudal lord, Duke Victor, gathered everyone who had not yet left the duchy in the capital. The situation in the duchy still had not stabilized. Underscore 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 at the capital's gates, there was a large number of guards thoroughly checking everyone that entered the city. Yesterday, Duke Victor had given an order that the city was to be placed under isolation. It seemed that the Ignaz family's thousand-dot-strong guard division had been completely annihilated by the beast men while returning to the duchy's capital. The young lady of the Ignaz family, Elena Ivy, and the Radiant Church's third holy maiden, Antonia Susan, were still unaccounted for. They were the ones who had led this division into the region a few days ago to hunt monsters. If they were with their guards when the ambush happened, they were most likely dead. Victor was at a loss of what to do as two very important girls had gone missing in his territory. It was fortunate that they had not yet found any bodies, otherwise, it would definitely be the end of him if they did. However, if he had known that something like this would happen, he would never have become the duke of this shitty place. Back when they were rewarding the new nobles, there were several other places that he could have taken, but all the other ones only came with the title of count. This was the only place that came with the position of a duke. Now that he looked back on it, that was definitely a trap. Lord Duke, our scouts have reported a large force of beast men heading to this city. Their numbers are at least 20,000. I believe that they should have arrived last night, but they ran into the Ignaz family's guards and got delayed. What? 20,000 beastmen warriors. Ford, get the servants to start packing. I'm going to the Gabriel Empire to seek refuge. I mean, to beg for reinforcements, bring everything that has value. Lord Duke, if you leave now, there will be no one left to organize the defense. I'm going to go and request for backup so you can organize the defense. Yes, it's settled. Duke Victor disregarded his subordinate's protest and insisted on fleeing from the city. The entire city was only defended by a thousand militia whose combat abilities were much lower than that of Ignaz Guard Division who had blocked a bullet for them. Victor believed that only a madman would stay and await sure death. The duke's subordinate quickly took flight as well after seeing that their lord had abandoned the city to its fate. He wasn't an idiot. His boss had already fled so there was no way that he would be willing to be the scapegoat for all of this. The news that the duke had fled spread like wildfire through the servants of his estate and the entirety of the town was made known of the fact within a few hours. The city fell into a state of chaos with everyone trying to get all their valuables out of the town. It looked as if the city was heading towards an impending apocalypse. Underscore 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 after quite some time, a group of what seemed to be adventurers arrived at the city's gates. There were only ten of them, and their professions seemed to be four knights, a swordswoman, four clerics, and an archer. This was, of course, Bella's group, who had come out to hunt monsters. Apart from the three Lolas who were only pretending to be clerics, the professions of the rest were right, for the most part. Don't be so glum Ivy. This is a battlefield. This kind of stuff happens too often, but it's also unavoidable. Bella was busy comforting the depressed Ivy. On their way to the city, they had received news about what had happened to the thousand-dot-strong guard division that had escorted Ivy and Susan all this way. Ivy had been heavily hit with the news. Those guards had served the Ignaz family for many years after all, and she knew a number of them personally. Hey Ivy, do you know Matilde Chris? Are you talking about the first princess of the Gabriel Empire? I knew her when we were little, I guess we were kind of childhood friends. Recently though, I feel as if she has drifted away from me. She doesn't really speak with me anymore. Do you remember when she started to drift away? Let me remember. I think it was about three years ago when she was twelve years old. That year, she was traveling with her father, the emperor, 
but the royal entourage was ambushed and the royal family's carriage was pierced by arrows. Chris was already adept with the sword at the time and managed to drive away the assassins after leaving the carriage. However, she had been hit with a poisoned arrow and passed out shortly after forcing away the assassins. She regained consciousness about a month later. According to Ivy's memory, Matilde Chris had woken up as a completely different person. The once extroverted and cheerful girl became introverted and apathetic, drifting away from all her former friends as if she no longer knew them. Her skills also rapidly increased, beating all other contestants in the royal tournament just a month after waking up and had not lost a sword fight ever since. Those who had lost to her claimed that her sword was too fast to be seen. This, along with how little she talked, earned her the unofficial title of Lonesome Sword. Bella, you should know Chris's beauty is much higher than any of Gabriel Empire's, swordsmen, three beauty swords, myself included. There are lots of suitors from distinguished families who want to claim her hand in marriage, but I feel as if she isn't interested in them at all. The best way to close distances between girls was to gossip with them. Ivy thought that Bella's question was trying to gossip with her and diminish her sorrow, which it had done quite well. Beto Dem based on just the information that Clement had brought her yesterday, Bella believed that this Chris wasn't so simple. Clement's subordinates had all been killed when they were gathering information on her, and the scariest part was that Clement's ghost scouts were all equipped with a mirror that could distort space and time, created by Nosha of course. Chris was able to cut through the spatial barrier and kill the ghosts. This was the first time that Bella had heard of someone being able to kill them when they were separated by a spatial barrier. Weren't Chris's cheats too broken? Clement also reported that she would settle most fights against other renowned swordsmen within three moves of her blade, with many opponents not even being able to see her first strike before losing. As the current most well-received Demon King subordinate in the Dark Sanctuary, Clement was relatively educated on the first Demon King Bella's interests. He then went to investigate Chris in person but was also defeated by her in three blows. After getting defeated, Clement did manage to gather some vital information on Chris. Her sword wasn't God.level equipment but something that seemed to have some sort of direct connection to her. It did seem to have the ability to cut through space and time, however. Chris's attack speed was also much faster than even a typical assassin, causing many people to not know what hit them. One, even more importantly, Clement braved his life and managed to bring back Chris's three sizes as well as her hobbies and likes, where she spent her time, as well as a rough sketch of her visage. Bella had felt emotional when she realized that she had such a dedicated gentleman among her subordinates. All this information was everything she wanted. If Bella's instinct was correct, this Chris was very likely also a transmigrator. The real Chris had most likely passed away during the month-long coma. Leisha's progress took at least a year, but Chris only took a month. She probably wasn't any weaker than Leisha. Bella wasn't going to find trouble with Chris as her current objective was to just stay as far away as possible from any other transmigrator who had a bajillion cheats on them. She didn't have any reason to do anything, but according to the subordinates that Dolores had sent to the demon continent, there was evidence that the seal on the ancient twelve demon kings was weakening rapidly. Soon these transmigrated heroes would have quite a problem on their hands. All Bella needed to do was stand on the side and watch. They had come to the capital of the duchy because Ivy wanted to enlist some mercenaries to help them. Originally, it would have been fine with just Bella and the others, but this morning, they had discovered more tracks belonging to pseudo-dragons of different sizes, it was probably a group of pseudo-dragons who had migrated. Ivy didn't think that just a few in their party were enough to deal with a group of pseudo-dragons, so Ivy had wanted to try her luck and see whether any mercenaries were willing to come with her. That's strange. Why isn't there anyone at the gates, not even any guards? When they arrived at the capital's gates, Susan found that there was no human in sight. The gates were wide open and even the streets inside were devoid of people. The only things they saw on the streets inside were variously scattered belongings. It appeared that whoever left these behind had left in a hurry. 
Right at this time, several furry figures dashed out of the two houses closest to them. Their target was the closest Susan, however, unfortunately, they didn't get very far before taking one of Annie's arrows on their heads. Wolfmen. There are beast men in this city. Looking at the wolfmen bodies that looked as if part of their heads had been blown off, Bella could only sigh and think of how archers had always been broken. This was the first time Bella had encountered a beast man. They seemed like werewolves from the movies she watched on Earth. Thank you. Susan felt fortunate for Annie's aid. Wolf men had always been the shock troops traveling ahead of beast men armies, and their purpose was to eliminate human mages. If it wasn't for Annie's quick reaction, she would have most likely gotten killed as she didn't have any time to cast defense magic. Annie acknowledged Susan's thanks with a nod. To not expose their identities, Annie and Roland followed Bella's order and didn't tell Ivy and Susan their real names. They claimed to be Bella's followers and wouldn't say anything else. Because of this and the fact that Susan and Ivy had never seen the two in person, they were unable to match this beautiful archer with the long dot missing first princess of the Kristoff Empire, archers slash assassins, Chris Annie. Sister, there is a huge number of beast men heading our way. Through the spirits in the area, Angel was able to detect a large army of beast men heading towards this abandoned city. 20,000 beast men warriors. Bella, I suggest we run for it. After hearing the news, Susan suggested an immediate withdrawal. After all, there were only ten of them, and there was no way they could fight off such a great force of beast men. Bella looked a little hesitantly at Susan and Ivy, if it wasn't for the two of them, Bella honestly believed that they could take on this beast men army. After all, on their side, they had effectively three demon kings, and as demon kings, they did have several large area dot of dot effect skills up their sleeves. If there weren't any outsiders here, they would have just blasted the beast men into oblivion. As Bella and the other two were technically another dimension's demon kings, those in this dimension couldn't detect the radiating dark aura customary of demon kings. Even Susan was no exception. Along with the fact that high dot level demons were basically identical to humans on the surface, she didn't recognize that Dolores was a demon either. If they were to use the Demon King's large dot scale abilities, however, even an idiot would be able to realize that Bella, Dolores, and Eleanor were Demon Kings. After all, all the AoE magics they knew were very explicitly demon. King like. Before she managed to convert Ivy and Susan to her side, Bella didn't want to expose her identity as a Demon King as it would most definitely hinder her goal in converting them. What made it even worse was that they didn't have any proper battle mages in their party. Angel could only be considered a soul mage if anything while Mia's curses and hexes couldn't be used with one of the church's holy maidens nearby. Dolores's magic was still pretty close to demons, and she also wouldn't be able to use it here. As for Nosha, Bella wanted to save her power for when they had to retreat in case they couldn't fight back the beast men. We can't outrun them as wolfmen are too fast, so we can only make our stand here. Ivy and Susan, take shelter in that watchtower over there. I'll get my followers to protect you too, I will guard the entrance with Dolores and Eleanor. We won't let any enemies through while we're still alive. But the enemy numbers 20,000, and you are only three. Even if you are all holy knights, you three don't even have any mounts. No problem boss, just take care of these three little ones for me. This is my duty as a knight. Anyways, it's a knight's honor to be able to protect such beautiful girls. This. Don't force yourselves. Retreat into the tower if you think you can't hold on. I'll light a signal fire at the tower's peak. The Gabriel Empire, swordsmen, will send reinforcements if they know I'm here. Looking at the three figures that stood at the base of the tower, Ivy was moved. As a swordswoman, she wasn't as armored as a knight and wouldn't be able to offer them any assistance. If no one came to their aid, this would probably be the end of their party. Susan was also moved, but there was something she didn't understand. The three Lolas didn't look to be scared or tense at all. This didn't match the reaction that should have been for girls their age, who normally would be scared to death. 
As for the calmness on the faces of the two night followers, Susan didn't know if they had already accepted death or if they knew they had nothing to fear. Angel came behind the archer, Annie, and lightly traced something on her back. Annie immediately felt as if everything in her field of view had been enlarged. She could very clearly see the beastmen forces in the distance heading their way. Angel's spiritual eye worked by borrowing the eyes of the spirits that wandered in the world and sharing their field of views. Basically, it meant that Annie no longer had a blind spot and could see everything in a certain radius. This kind of ability was priceless to long-range units such as mages and the like, but as they did not currently have any mages in hand, Angel could only settle for the sole long-range unit in their party, the archer, Annie. Roland went to guard the stairs in case any enemies slipped through the defenses downstairs. The flag of the church had already been raised over the watchtower, the archer Annie was prepared. Mia was helping her prepare the arrows. She took advantage of the moments when Susan and Ivy looked away to stealthily enchant the arrows with her specialty. Curses and Hexes Angel stood on the side, seemingly looking into the distance. She was actually controlling several undeads as scouts to observe the state of the battlefield. As for No Shah, she was talking with Ivy and Susan, drawing their attention away from where Mia was buffing Annie's arrows. The three knights Bell, Dolores, and Eleanor were waiting at the base of the tower, armed with shield and sword. Looking at the incoming horde of beast men, then at the watchtower behind her, Bella felt as if she was playing a tower defense game, and had a strange urge to yell, you shall not pass. Dot, 2, TL notes, 1, numbered in order of seniority of becoming a demon king, Bella is first, Dolores second, and Eleanor third, 2, raw here is, lacks a direct translation because it's a reference to Chinese League of Legends. Volume 1 Chapter 18 the Unfortunate Fate of the Beastman's Expeditionary Army You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator The light edits by Lord Immortal in the skies above, two griffin knights were patrolling. Even from a distance, they were able to see the thick smoke rising from the capital of the Alva Duchy. They originally planned to ignore it as they had already received the news from the southern command center of the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, that the feudal lord of the duchy, Duke Victor, had already fled from the city with his subordinates. The current duchy capital should be no more than a ghost town, but that smoke had the special color of one of the empire's three big families, the Ignaz family. The young lady of the Ignaz family, Elena Ivy, one, had gone missing in this region recently. This colored smoke could very well be her signal for help. The two griffin knights passed over the mountains and approached the airspace of the capital. As they got closer, they were able to see a large advance force of 20,000 wolfmen encircling a single watchtower, and the smoke came from the top of the tower. The flag of the Radiant Church flew over the tower. It seemed that this tower was being defended by the members of the church. At the base of the watchtower, three female knights were blocking the path from the onslaught of the wolfmen. The state of battle was very heated. The beast men had originally wanted to overpower the three knights with their sheer number and force them apart before defeating them one by one. It seemed that the commander of these wolf men was relatively intelligent, knowing that a large number of the Radiant Church's knights was on the level of holy knights and that the three knights before them must at least be holy knights, seeing how calm they were. However, a dismounted knight was nothing to fear. In theory, it shouldn't be very hard to kill three dismounted holy knights after separating them. The wolfmen warriors easily separated the three knights, then as soon as they actually entered combat, they discovered that they had been tricked. These three were most definitely demons in the armor of a knight. The golden blonde knight was the fiercest. She had foregone the shield and instead swung around a large two-dot-handed sword. Countless beast men who had gotten too close were bisected by her, their weapons not even being able to scratch her armor. Sometimes, when the sword in her hands was engaged with another, she would simply kick the nearby wolfmen and send them flying several meters away. Most people would probably believe it if one were to tell them that she was a berserker instead of a knight. The purple dot haired knight was the most gruesome. She didn't even wield her sword, leaving it sheathed on her back alongside her shield. 
Her weapon was a pair of glistening metal claws. The wolfmen who got near her were ripped apart and eviscerated with several quick strikes. Just like with the blonde knight, the beastman's weapons did nothing but send sparks flying off her armor. It didn't take long before a pile of mutilated bodies built up around her. The redhead knight was more normal, relative to the other two knights at least. She wielded the standard sword and shield, using the shield to knock beastmen back and the sword to cut them down. The only problem was that once again, she was unscathed from the beastmen's attacks. It was evident from the number of bodies that this envelopment had gone on for quite a while, but the three knights didn't show any signs of fatigue. It felt as if they had limitless stamina. Several hundred beastmen warriors had been killed in the short time the griffin knights had been watching. The arrows from the top of the watchtower also contributed to the body count, no matter where the arrow hit, even if it was just a scratch, it would be an immediate death for the beastman. Those who were hit by the arrows rapidly shriveled up as if they had all the blood drained from their bodies. Even for the fearless beastmen, this was quite a gruesome way to die. Several beastmen had, by sheer luck, made it past the three knights and tried to deal with the archer on the tower but had their way blocked by a blue dot haired female knight that had appeared out of nowhere, leaving them unable to pass. They were only able to watch as the archer shot ducks in a barrel. The beastmen advance party was made completely out of agile wolfmen warriors, without any long dot ranged unit capable of dealing with the archer that was thinning their numbers. The two griffin knights almost fell off their mounts in shock as they witnessed the scene. These three masked knights managed to hold their ground against 20,000 beastmen and successfully made it look lopsidedly favored towards the three of them. This wasn't something that holy knights should be able to do. Were these three females dragon knights? But a dragon knight was able to summon their mount at any time. If they were dragon knights, why didn't they summon their mounts? It would definitely make the killing a lot faster. Bella carried her shield on her back, too lazy to bother defending. Even though the armor she wore was just a normal set of knight's plate armor and wielded a normal steel sword, her demon king aura buffed her armor and weapon to the point where she wouldn't be damaged by the beast men. She would be able to cut through them like butter. It was rather unfortunate for the beast men surrounding them. A new demon king required reaping of lives to become awakened, and only then could they be considered a real demon king. These beast men just happened to have the fortune of being free experience for the three unawakened demon kings Bella, Dolores, and Eleanor. Looking at the beast men who were killed by arrows, Bella was rather envious of how much more convenient it was to be an archer. Even though as a demon king, Bella would never feel fatigued, it would still get boring after a while of repeating the same actions. Because Susan and Ivy were watching, Mia wasn't able to buff the three knights. If they had the same buff that Mia had given to Annie, the rate of death amongst the beast men would be much higher. On top of the watchtower, Susan looked down at the three knights surrounded by a sea of beastmen in shock. She had originally wanted to support the knights with her healing magic but realized after a while that she was completely unneeded as the beastmen couldn't even get through the plate armor of the knights. She still wasn't sure of the final outcome, however, as she looked at the giant mass that was the beastmen advance force. Lady Ivy, Lady Holy Maiden, are you two all right? The two griffin knights took advantage of the fact that the beast men did not have any anti-air forces and quickly descended at the top of the watchtower. Luckily, we had reinforcements from the church. Where are the reinforcements? What happened to the soldiers of the Empire's southern army? Why are they not here yet? This signal fire's been lit for half a day already. Lady Ivy Duke Victor and his men ran into the beastmen's main force during their escape. There are no survivors. The entirety of the Empire's southern army has dug in the Laird line, waiting for the Empire to send Magi from the Magic Division to their aid before they sally out to confront the beastmen. It's best if you two come with us. We can take you two back to the Laird line. How could this have happened? Then what will happen to them? Ivy gestured to Bella and the others. Lady Ivy, our griffins can only carry one more aside from us, so. 
the two griffin knights couldn't blatantly say that they had to abandon Bella and the others who were knights of the church due to the sheer authority that the Radiant Church held. They could only hint that to Ivy and Susan. Then you two go back without me. I can't just leave like this after I brought them into this mess. Why don't you go, Susan? I'm staying as well, we are all part of the same church after all. I would feel guilty for the rest of my life if I leave them to die here. Ivy declined the Griffin Knight's offer, Susan did as well. Even though she and Bella were from opposing factions, she unconsciously felt that she shouldn't leave. Seeing that the two were obstinate on staying, the two Griffin Knights could only retreat and report back to the Laird line and see if they could get more Griffin Knights to be sent here to rescue all of the girls. While Bella was moved by the fact that the two girls were choosing to stay behind, but if they stayed, Bella and the others wouldn't be able to show their true ability. By staying behind, weren't Ivy and Susan inadvertently screwing over their teammates? Oh well, Bella thought to herself as she returned to the slaughter but not before gesturing to Angel with her eyes to send a few ghosts to call in the reinforcements. The Griffin Knights encountered a large force of beastmen shortly after they left, numbering around a hundred thousand with all sorts of beast men mixed within. This army waved a flag embroidered with a set of wolf fangs. It was evident that this beast men army belonged to the wolfmen tribe. After they discovered the griffin knights in the sky, countless arrows flew and the unlucky knights were killed along with their mounts mid-air without a chance to send a signal about what they had seen. It wasn't that their armor was of bad quality, but that there were simply too many arrows. The only fortunate thing was that as Ivy and Susan had chosen not to run, they managed to dodge another bullet. Underscore underscore underscore, Lord Duke, the advance guard's commander, Lord Colin, has sent an emergency report detailing that the advance guard has met fierce resistance at Alva City from Knights of the Church. They have been unable to take the main watchtower. Dot, didn't we kill that fat feudal lord already? Why are there knights from the church in that city? I remember our scouts reported that the Alva Duchy didn't have any of the Radiant Church's chapels. How many knights are holding off Colin's forces? There are. Around. Ten. Only ten. I can't smell the scent of a dragon so there shouldn't be any dragon knights in the vicinity, so those knights should only be holy knights at most. Is that Colin so useless that he is allowing his 20,000 warriors to be stopped by a mere 10 holy knights? Wolfman General Duke still hadn't recovered from the shock that his decorated subordinate Colin had been stopped by a measly 12 knights and was about to dispatch reinforcements when suddenly an oppressive aura swept over him and his army. He raised his head and was scared witless. Directly in front of the Wolfman army, a large force of bleached skeleton soldiers had formed neat and tidy squares and was advancing in a line that had them set on a crash course to the Beastmen army. Each of the skeletons was clad in a white plate mail and wielded both a three-dot-meter dot long bone spear and a bone shield studded with bone sykes. Apart from the skeleton infantry, Duke could see several wooden machines being pushed up behind the white army. If Duke remembered properly, these were the essential tools of human siege warfare. The catapult. He didn't know how these undead managed to obtain human weapons. The skeleton army didn't number any less than the wolfmen. After a glance, Duke estimated that both armies had about the same numbers. What made him the most worried was the five-dot-meter tall skeleton in the ranks of the white army. Apart from its height, this skeleton had quite a few other distinctions from the other skeletons around him. Clad in a heavy pitch dot black full dot body plate armor and wielding a jet dot black shield and sword which were the same height as it, this skeleton didn't seem like someone you'd want to mess with. Skeleton Emperor Fred looked strangely at the Beastmen army on the other side. Their number was different from that which Lady Angel had reported. Wasn't there supposed to only be 20,000 of them? Why did it look like they had the same number as Fred's own 100,000 skeletons? Fred didn't think too much after this as all he knew was that the command was to kill the beast men. Fred readjusted the crown on his head and then raised the giant sword in his hand. Seeing his gesture, the skeletons ahead of him hurriedly made way for their sovereign as they knew that their boss was going to use one of his special moves. 
After all the skeleton soldiers had gotten out of the way, Fred swiftly swung his sword downwards, cutting through the air. A pitch dot black blade of Jian Chi ten meters in height traveled towards the beast men army, forcefully splitting their forces into two. The beast men who came into contact with the Jian Chi left behind no corpse, they were split into many tiny pieces and scattered around. It was quite a gruesome sight to behold. Fortunately for Duke, he wasn't at the center of the army currently and had managed to dodge the attack. However, he had already lost the will to fight. This one strike from Fred had not only killed 2,000 beast men but also their courage. Soon after, the catapults at the rear of the skeleton army started their reign of terror. Several dozens flaming boulders arced over the skeletons and onto the beast men, disrupting their formation with many beast men being launched into the air by the impact's explosion. While the beastmen's formation was being broken, the skeletons began their advance. They set their spears at the same angle and direction and advanced with quick steps. In the face of the advancing square formations, the beast men who already had their formation disrupted were unable to mount a proper counterattack. Many beast men warriors were killed on the spot by the long bone spears of the skeletal army. Seeing the scene unfold before him, Duke wanted to sound the retreat, but unfortunately, he discovered that it was already too late to retreat. His army had been surrounded from all sides by the evil beings. Apart from the skeletal army right ahead of them, there was also a large force of zombies behind them, led by a six-dot-meter tall ghoul. The light reflecting off the ghoul's cleaver sent shivers down Duke's spine. On the zombies' flanks were what seemed to be shimmering ghostly figures and a peculiar force of humanoid evil beings that all wore a clown mask on their face. Hell's Warden Mouths, Shadowless Demon Tamper, and Bone Dot Corroding Duke Adrian, these old friends move pretty fast. Fred wasn't too shocked to see those who had just arrived. Angel Summons wasn't very choosy, and every one of the Dark Sanctuary's evil beings in the area had received it. The combined total of the Dark Sanctuary armies numbered at 40,000 along with four Dark Suzerains of terrifying power. Duke's Beastmen Expeditionary Army was unable to leave the completely unavoidable massacre. No one else would ever know what happened here. As the Dark Sanctuary needed a large number of corpses to turn into zombie laborers, these Beastmen bodies will be turned into zombies to work for the very ones that killed them, if they were still usable of course. Those who didn't leave behind enough body parts would be eaten on the spot by Maltz's ghouls. It wouldn't take long after the battle before the only thing left behind were streaks and splatters of blood. Underscore 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 back at the Alva Duchy's capital, Bella and the others had already killed around a fourth of the Wolfmen advance force. The remaining 15,000 or so beastmen retreated to the city gates but kept looking at Bella's watchtower. The two sides had clashed for most of the day, and the night was swiftly approaching. What's happening, why is it that none of my subordinates are here yet? Bella leaned against the wall and asked herself. It was strange that not a single one of her underlings had arrived yet to reinforce her, Skeleton Emperor Fred should have been here long ago with how close he was unless he was held back by something on the way. Currently, Fred and the other evil suzerains were preoccupied with the massacre of Duke's Beastmen army. As they were all evil beings, it was easy for them to lose themselves after they started seeing blood. They were having a killing high and had forgotten to send a subordinate to report their situation to Bella, leaving her wondering what had happened to them. Currently, everyone in Bella's group was dyed red with the fresh blood of beast men. It was 20,000 beast men after all. The battle had been intense and quite a few beast men had made their way around the three knights and onto the watchtower due to their sheer numbers. On the watchtower, the stairs were already piled up with beast men bodies. Ivy and Susan had already retreated back to the base of the church's flag, and they too were covered in beast men blood. It was evident how heated the battle was as even the cleric had been dragged into the melee. Sister Ivy, Sister Susan, can you two still walk? That's something we're still able to do little Nosha, but why do you ask? After nightfall, we will make our escape and break through the encirclement on the other side of the city. Angel has already scouted a path. TL notes, 
One, I do realize that it's weird that Ignaz isn't in Ivy's name, I went ahead and checked but couldn't find any mention of it, and neither of her family members are referred to by their last name so I assume that Elena is just her middle name. We'll keep mentions of her as Elena Ivy though. Volume 1 Chapter 19 The Unexpected Beauty You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator the light edits by Lord Immortal The dawn's early light shone upon the outskirts of the unnamed forest and illuminated the path of a group of what seemed to be adventurers who were cautiously advancing into the forest. Their clothing and armor were dyed and crusted with blood. It was very evident that they had just been through a very bloody fight. I'm sorry Bella. It was all because I wanted to hire some mercenaries. No problem, Boss Ivy. You can make it up by paying us an extra 10% after we finish this mission. You don't need to call me boss, we're friends, aren't we? Call me Ivy. Last night in the Duchy's capital, Bella and the others had to endure until nightfall before they were able to make their escape. Fortunately, her subordinates who had been previously messing around somewhere finally arrived around the same time and launched a surprise attack on the Beastman advance guard, inadvertently helping the escape of Bella and the others. Due to the low visibility, Ivy and Susan weren't able to see what had befallen on the Beastmen forces. They were only able to hear the terrified screams and death throes coming from the opposing camp. After an entire night of traveling, the party finally managed to make it to the outskirts of the unnamed forest. Can we rest for a bit Bella? I'm getting tired. Bella didn't have any objections to Susan's suggestion. After all, they had traveled non-stop the entire night and were fatigued, thirsty, and hungry because they had no time to bring rations with them during their escape. They currently only had two choices. Return to Bella's church for a day to rest and make preparations again, or they could rest on the spot and find a way to solve their hunger. Considering that Susan, Ivy, as well as Roland and Annie were still human and not the demon kings or gods that Bella and the others were, they were probably too tired. Additionally, it wouldn't be suitable to return to the church currently. It would be best if they could find a place nearby to rest. Angel, is this place safe? About this, sis Bella, there aren't any. So I'm not sure either, sorry. Angel was confused as she was unable to sense any spirits in their nearby vicinity. If there weren't any spirits wandering the area, Angel's scouting ability would be heavily limited. To not incur the suspicion of the Holy Maiden, Susan, Angel decided that it wasn't the best idea to evoke spirits from further away to help. No problem, it should be fine as long as we're careful. Bella lightly patted Angel's head to comfort her as this wasn't her fault. It was just that the uncertainties involved in this expedition would dramatically increase without Angel scouting. The forest was very quiet so early in the morning, and they had not run into any monsters yet. Previously, Bella had led a bunch of her subordinates on extermination runs throughout the forest's outskirts and it would probably be quite a while before the monster population here recovered. Bella followed the tracks of the wild animals in the hope of finding water, and her hard work paid off. After around an hour, they heard the sound of a moving body of water. As they got closer, they found a large stream with crystal clear water and a gentle current. Mia approached the stream and studied it for a while before giving confirmation to Bella with her eyes. Bella understood that this water didn't have any problems, at the very least there weren't any curses or poison in it. She trusted Mia's expertise in this field. Seeing a clean source of water, all the other girls immediately wanted to go and clean themselves of the blood that had covered every exposed inch of their body. Now that they finally had time, nothing could stop them from cleaning themselves, even Dolores seemed to be really eager. Even though she was really into it while killing, it was as if she returned to being a normal girl right after who just wanted to be clean. Why aren't you stripping Bella? Your clothes are just as dirty as ours. While she was stripping, Susan turned back to see Bella just standing there and asked curiously. You all can wash first, and I'll go patrol the surroundings for now. I'll wash later. All right, stay safe. Bella actually really wanted to stay behind and bathe with these beauties as only a dumbass would refuse such a boon. 
Bella instinctively realized that girls were the most vulnerable while they were bathing and were less able to deal with emergency situations if any were to occur. This was a place notorious for the number of monsters after all, and she had to make necessary preparations to prevent any monsters or perverts from getting close. Bella came to a large patch of unnaturally long grass not too far from the stream and drew a large and peculiar magic formation on the ground. As soon as she finished the last stroke on the formation, there was some stirring from the ground below her, as if something was breaking out of it. Seeing that the ritual had been completed, Bella swiftly left the area. Not long after she left, several zombies in a high state of decay broke through the ground with many more still on their way out as the formation was still pulsating. These zombies were all the adventurers in this area who had been slaughtered by the monsters and had been buried in the ground for God knows how long. They probably contributed to why the grass in this area was so unnaturally long. This A, Summon Undetta, was a dark magic formation that Mia had taught Bella, who then modified it so that the summoned undead would only attack males. Now Bella could finally return and bathe with the girls without the worry of being interrupted. If any pervert was fortunate enough to wander into the area, he would be in for a lifetime of enjoyment. Bella had a sinister smirk on her face as she left. She withdrew not because she was afraid that they would attack her but that she was scared of having nightmares after seeing such decomposed zombies. As for the possibility of a stray monster, most of them would avoid being anywhere near such a large number of zombies. Only Bella who set the formation would be able to cancel it from the distance. If anybody else wanted to do so, they would have to find the heart of the ritual where the actual formation was located and then destroy it to stop the summoning. Bella believed that it wouldn't take long for all the dead near the stream to be awoken. As Bella was about to return, she saw an article of clothing drifting downstream. As she had spent all her time around a large number of girls, she was easily able to recognize that it belonged to a female. Eh, which one of them was so careless to let their clothes fall into the water while bathing. Bella picked up a branch from near the stream and used it to pick the piece of clothing out of the stream. Right after, she remembered that Ivy and the others were bathing downstream, so their clothes couldn't have floated upstream. This article most likely didn't belong to any of the girls in Bella's party. Bella felt the material of the article, then studied the design and was able to confirm that this did not belong to anyone in her party. As they had already changed into the outfits designed by Bella herself, from their outer garments to their underwear, she only needed to feel the material to know if it was one of her designs. Bella brought the piece of clothing towards her nose and sniffed it. A faint but elegant and pleasant scent traveled into her nostrils. Bella had smelled this kind of scent on the other beauties in her company. It should be the natural body scent of beautiful girls so the owner of this garment should be fairly good looking. The scent, however, was slightly different and Bella couldn't connect it with any girl she knew as she had remembered the scent of all the girls in her party. What to do? The owner of this garment was probably bathing somewhere upstream. It would be very awkward for her to discover that she had lost her clothes, and it would be rather bad for the owner if she only brought one set of clothes in such a dangerous place and lost it. Right as Bella was hesitating, the gentle current brought another piece of clothing with it. Seeing as it was the same type of thermal underwear that Roland and Annie wore previously, Bella stopped hesitating. She decided to follow the stream and look for the owner of these lost articles of clothing, and to see if she needed any help. Underscore 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 right as Bella was traveling upstream, in the forest near the stream, a well-dot-equipped party of adventurers was engaged in combat with the zombies that Bella had summoned. This party had at least a hundred adventurers and were all fairly skilled, not panicking under the assault of such a large number of zombies and being able to maintain their formation's integrity. If these were normal zombies, the adventurers would have beaten them off long ago, but these were those that Bella had summoned. She had placed several drops of juice from the A. Devil's Wistoma. On the summoning formation, causing the summoned undead to retain some intelligence and combat ability from when they were still adventurers. Seeing that they were unable to break through the party's defenses, the zombies chose to back off and encircle the adventurers. During this stalemate, there was a constant stream of new zombies joining the already large group. 
This party of adventurers didn't have any mages or clerics with them and only had archers as their ranged units. They were forced to fight passively. S asterisk asterisk asterisk, where did all these zombies come from? I thought that there were only monsters in the unnamed forest. A handsome swordsman with golden hair was complaining. He hadn't expected to run into any evil beings during this expedition into the unnamed forest, which was why he had not brought any mages or clerics with him. Now, he was shocked when he ran into zombies who seemed to have some semblance of intelligence and didn't just rush at them like normal. Don't be so impatient Leonard. Chris shouldn't have run too far. We just found some of her clothes near the stream, did we not? She is probably bathing somewhere upstream, hee hee. I'm warning you, Edwin. Chris is my Fianca copyright e don't even try to make a move on her. Che, if it wasn't for your dad having good relations with the Gabriel Empire's emperor, would you still be able to get engaged with Chris? I am the Christoph Empire's, assassins slash archers, third prince after all, and my standing isn't any lower than you, the young master of the Gabriel Empire's Brittany family. I still want to compete for Chris. The golden-haired youth was busy arguing with a male archer with short-cut brown hair. They didn't discover that at the back of their party, a somber look came onto a swordsman with his head lowered. His facial features were heavily distorted, and it definitely wasn't an expression that a human should be able to make. I didn't expect these two to have such close relationships with the Gabriel Empire's number one hero, Matilde Chris. That girl put me through hell last time. I'll regain my dignity from her friends this time, hee <laughs> hee. Clement looked at the two males of noble birth who were still arguing about who Chris belonged to, and a sinister smile crept onto his face. Leonard and Edwin did not know that currently, some distance away, after receiving news from a master of Fasisa. Clement, Bone. Corroding Dukia. Adrian Anda. Hells Wardina. Malts were on the way with their personal armies of bone dot breakers and ghouls. Underscore 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 Bella followed the water upstream for a while and came to the river head, a small lake. Even from a distance, Bella was able to see a girl swimming around agitatedly as if she was looking for something. Bella then looked around the lake but wasn't able to find any clothes that might belong to the girl. This girl seemed to be the one that had lost her clothes to the current. This girl had beautiful silver dot white hair. To Bella who had loved silver hair even from her time on earth, this was quite a sight. Currently, the only silver dot haired girls in Bella's company were the two Lolas, Angel and Mia, and evidently not enough to satisfy Bella's obsession with silver hair. Due to the angle, Bella could only see the silver dot haired girl's porcelain dot like back and not her face. Right as Bella was hesitating over whether to go and greet the girl or not, she saw a large black snake about six meters in length swimming upstream against the current towards the girl. Isn't that a deep dot sea serpent? Why is it in a stream? S asterisk asterisk asterisk, that girl is in danger. Bella's subordinates had previously given one of these serpents to her as a tribute. Although these deep dot sea serpents weren't very strong fighters, they were able to unleash a strong paralyzing poison into the water whilst hunting prey. When caught unaware, these deep dot sea serpents were equally dangerous as other monsters of its size. This serpent was evidently much more dangerous than the three dot meter one that Bella's subordinates had offered. The serpent last time was killed so easily by an evil suzerain because its toxins had no effect on any sort of dark existence, but this silver dot haired girl didn't seem like a demon at all to Bella. After she realized this, Bella looked for a place to dive into the water to go and save the girl. Seeing as the serpent had not immediately attacked, Bella quickly undressed and got into the water. She had to strip because this serpent's toxins were able to corrode normal clothes. It would be rather awkward for Bella to save someone but be left without clothes. The deep dot sea serpent hesitated for a while before finally deciding to attack. It swam quickly towards the girl, jumped out of the water, and flew towards her. The girl turned around to see the source of the commotion and came face to face with the flying serpent and froze in shock. In the nick of time, however, 
Bella finally managed to swim close enough and sent a right hook that sent the serpent flying and leaving it seeing stars. The power behind this punch was nothing to laugh at. It was just that she wasn't wearing her metal gauntlets. If she was, that punch would have been able to tear straight through the skull of the deep dot sea serpent. Luckily, she didn't because snake-type monsters usually had their magic cores inside their skulls. It would be troublesome if she accidentally shattered it as it was the only cure to the serpent's poison. Bella also didn't want to scare this silver-dot-haired beauty with the bloody scene of her beating the brains out of this snake. Because of this, the serpent quickly recovered from its dizziness and turned its giant mouth towards the new attacker. The silver dot haired beauty behind Bella either seemed to have been scared witless or had been paralyzed by the deep dot sea serpent's poison. After seeing the golden dot haired beauty that was Bella, the serpent immediately froze. It had some semblance of intellect and was able to sense that even though she had the appearance of a human girl, her distinct scent of high dot tiered evil being drove fear into its small brain. This deep dot sea serpent had just escaped that dangerous place and had only wanted to hunt some prey for sustenance but had run into some girls who also had the dangerous scent of top dot tier evil beings downstream. It was spooked into furiously swimming upstream. Here, it finally found a prey which it felt that it could handle even though this silver dot haired beauty also. But it decided to give it a try to not starve to death. Unfortunately, Bella had stepped in and quashed its hopes. It originally wanted to try fighting but after seeing Bella's ravenous eyes, felt that it would definitely be killed if it stayed. Bella wasn't going to let the prey get away after it had entered her sight. No Shah and the others downstream were still hungry after all. Bella straight up leaped towards the monster and delivered another thundering punch, much heavier than the last, sending the serpent flying out of the water and partly onto the shore. As it was about to struggle to make its escape, several terrifying shadowy hands reached out of the bushes and forcefully dragged the six-dot-meter-long monster into the shrubbery. That tamper is finally here. I'll leave that deep-dot sea serpent to him. Only now did Bella remember the silver-dot-haired beauty on the side. She turned around and made eye contact with the girl's beautiful violet irises. Why did this girl seem so familiar? Bella thought for a while and froze. Wasn't this the girl that Clement had drawn for her previously? The first princess of the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, Matilde Chris. But according to Clement's drawing, Chris was supposed to have black hair. It didn't match up at all, was Clement messing with her? Only later would Bella find out that the evil being Clement was completely colorblind and couldn't differentiate between any color. The only color he remembered was the black locks of Bella's true body when she created him, which was why he drew Chris's hair as black as well. Right now, Bella only wanted to run. She hadn't brought a weapon with her and Chris's blades reportedly appear from thin air. Bella didn't think that she would be able to win against Chris in this state. Dot after recovering from the shock of the deep dot sea serpent's attack, Chris didn't take any hostile actions towards Bella but instead grabbed Bella from behind before she could make her escape. Please don't leave. Can you help me? I'm scared by myself. After hearing Chris's feeble plea for help, Bella stopped in her tracks as she couldn't hear any hostility in her voice. Even though Chris was very likely a transmigrated hero just like Leisha, she didn't seem like the type to start a fight at first sight as Leisha did. Volume 1 Chapter 20 The Lonesome Sword Secret You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator The Light Edits by Lord Immortal, Hey, uh, would you mind letting me go first? Bella was currently being embraced from behind by Chris and could feel the beauty's elasticity. She was somewhat overwhelmed by the feeling. I can't move. My entire body feels numb. Can you help me out of the water? Based on her speech and actions, Bella didn't think that Chris was lying, but this girl might have been a bit too naive, telling someone she had just met that she couldn't move her body. If Bella had any hostile intentions towards her, Chris would be done for. Even Chris herself didn't know exactly why she told Bella the fact that she was unable to move her body. 
Perhaps it was because she was charmed by how dashing Bella looked when she threw herself at the deep dot sea serpent to save Chris and didn't think further about why Bella just happened to be in the right place to save her. Are you really unable to move? Yes. Can you bring me to land first? My body will recover from that monster's poison pretty fast. As Chris had personally asked her, Bella couldn't say no. She turned around, picked up Chris in a princess carry, and walked towards the shore. The water here was only around a meter in depth, and it wasn't very hard for Bella to move while carrying someone in her arms. She took advantage of this time to carefully study the beauty in her arms. It seemed that Ivy hadn't lied to her. Chris was indeed much more beautiful than Ivy, so much that it seemed as if the two of them weren't even on the same level. Chris had a devilish figure that was very well dot proportioned, without a single unnecessary gram of fat. At a glance, Chris's height was about the same as Bella's, as was her chest size. Using the knowledge that she had gained as a fashion designer on Earth, Bella determined that Chris's body was very likely to have met the golden ratio. Within Bella's party, even Dolores, who had the best body amongst them, was not as decked out in the figure department as Chris. What made Bella unable to remove her sight from though was Chris' face. It was possibly the most beautiful thing that she had ever seen. For a moment, Bella even suspected that Chris wasn't a human. After all, Bella had never seen a human girl with violet eyes before. Dolores had mentioned that violet irises were a trait of high dot tier demons that humans were unable to imitate. Not all demons had violet irises but those who had were most definitely either a demon themselves or had some sort of close relationship to them. One such case was a dark creatura. Mystica, who also had beautiful violet irises. Apart from this, Chris's perfect appearance gave off some sort of mysterious aura that was attracting Bella to her. The only other person about whom Bella had felt something similar to was Dolores. It was a kind of exotic blend of dark and light that as she was a mixed dot blood of demon and angel. However, according to all intel, Chris was just a normal human. How did she obtain such an outlandish aura that should be impossible for a human? Bella carried Chris out of the water. It originally shouldn't have taken much time at all, however, Bella had purposely slowed her pace down greatly. She couldn't help it. Chris' body that felt like top dot grade silk was too addicting, and she couldn't bring herself to let Chris go a second before she had to. As for why Bella was walking so slowly while carrying her, Chris didn't feel anything wrong with it. It had been a while since she had been able to relax without any worry. After transmigrating to this world, all she did was train her swordsmanship as well as deal with her father's incessant promoting of suitors for her. Chris didn't want to get too close to anyone from this foreign world as she had already suffered too much heartache in the previous worlds she had been to. Besides, the suitors that her father introduced were only those who wanted her for her beauty and not to have a proper and romantic relationship. Chris had previously overheard the female palace servants gossiping amongst themselves about how the Empire's other princesses and noble maidens would call her a bad omen behind her back. It seemed that silver hair was viewed as a sign of bad fortune by humans. Her body's original owner had black hair but it was changed when Chris's soul fused with her body due to some special reasons. Even her father, the Emperor, initially thought that Chris had been cursed or possessed by a demon and had gotten the Church of Light's three cardinals to check. If it wasn't for the fact that they had guaranteed Chris was not a demon nor had any relationship with them, Chris probably would have been handed over by her father to be burned at the stake by the church. In the three years after, Chris broke ties with all the friends of the body's previous owner, not wanting to be hurt anymore. To not be treated as an ornament, she used several of the powers that she had gained from her previous worlds to easily beat a number of the Empire's renowned swordsmen. About a year ago, Chris single dot handedly slew a powerful monster and received the title of hero from the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, and finally managed to escape the fate of becoming one of her father's political pieces. However, that wasn't the end of it. The Emperor, knowing that he could not force Chris, had arranged for suitors to personally pester her to marry them. 
Chris nearly went crazy dealing with the large number of them and had almost let her dark side take over. There was a deep secret hidden within Chris's spirit that she had not let anyone know. To not repeat the tragedies of her past few lives, Chris decided to flee. She pretended to agree to a suitor's invitation for an outing and purposely chose a location near the Alba Duchy. It was infamous for being unstable due to being a place of constant warfare between humans and beast men. It wouldn't be that strange for someone to go missing in this region. As expected, the party was ambushed by evil beings of unknown origin not too far from the duchy's capital, and Chris used the ensuing chaos to make her escape. In her rush, she had not been able to take a map, so she had no choice but to wander the forests where no one could find her. On her way, Chris had run into multiple beast men raiding parties and defeated all of them. If one were to make a count, her kill count since yesterday wasn't much lower than that of Bella and the others at the watchtower, having killed at least several thousand beast men. What happened to Chris later was exactly what happened to Bella and the others. She was soaked in blood and had come to this river head to clean herself and hadn't noticed her clothes drifting away with the current. When Chris finally realized this, she looked high and low for her clothes, not noticing the stealthily approaching deep dot sea serpent. In the split second when she had suddenly come face to face with the deep dot sea serpent, her human instinct from her last life took over and she froze in fear, forgetting to summon her various famous blades from her exclusive space. Fortunately for her, Bella was in the right place at the right time and had spotted the serpent, or Chris would have been in trouble. Bella carried Chris to a large and flat rock in the grass by the river head. The body of a deep dot sea serpent lay beside it, the very same that was killed by shadowless Demona. Tamper earlier. There were no visible wounds on the serpent but its serpentine eyes were opened wide as if it had not died peacefully. To Bella who knew that this serpent was smothered by Tamper using his shadows, she could understand why this deep dot sea serpent had not passed on peacefully. Seeing the terrifying torment suffered by the deep dot sea serpent before its death, Chris was a little afraid while Bella was rather unfazed. Tamper had controlled himself this time. All of Bella's subordinate evil suzerains were rather sadistic in the way they killed their opponents. If Bella didn't have a use for this serpent's corpse, it would probably have been shredded into tiny pieces. Bella placed Chris on the flat rock and was about to stand up when her hand was grabbed by Chris who had regained a bit of strength. Sister, can you help me with something? I can't find my clothes. You should have arrived in this area with an adventuring party, right? Where are they? I'll. No. I came here alone. There's no one else. Chris straight up denied Bella's suggestion even before she finished her sentence. It had taken her so much work to escape, and it would have all been for naught if she were to return now. Although Bella was curious as to why Chris had denied her suggestion, she decided not to ask the reason after seeing the resolve in her attitude. All Bella could do right now was to put on her clothes immediately, go back, and ask Nosha and the others to see if they had any extra clothes. What's wrong? Are you all right? Bella had just walked a short distance to retrieve her clothes and saw Chris's excited eyes staring at the clothes in her hands. Following her gaze, she discovered that Chris's line of sight was focused on her underwear. This was the underwear that Bella had designed herself not Chris's which she had fished out of the water earlier. She couldn't understand why Chris was so excited. From their short amount of contact, she could determine that Chris was a softy and not a pervert who would fawn over underwear, unlike that naughty lowly Nosha. Chris couldn't hide the excitement in her heart. This was the first time she had seen something from her homeland, Earth, in another world. Even though it was only similar in design with different materials, the style was definitely that of Earth's. Sister, can you tell me where you got that piece of clothing? This. I designed this myself. I'm a part dot time tailor. Do you want a set too? I'll give you a discount if you order now. Chris thought for a while and agreed to buy a set from Bella. As she didn't know much about her, she couldn't very well ask if she was a transmigrator. 
After all, she had never run into another transmigrator in all her previous worlds. It would be best to save the question after they knew each other better. Underscore 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 not too far from the stream, the several hundred strong adventuring party had already met its end. Apart from the few that managed to escape, the rest were massacred by the ghouls and bone dot breakers who had encircled them from behind. Currently, a large number of ghouls were doing cleanup work in the area. Not far from the scene, three evil suzerains were holding a meeting. Beside them was a special zombie awaiting the suzerain's decision. This zombie was the commander of the zombies that had been summoned by Bella previously, and its intelligence was much higher than the others. Those two little boys ran too fast, or else I would have dragged them back to my dungeon and played with them, hee <laughs> hee. It has been a while since I've caught such tender meat. It's getting really boring with nothing to play with in my dungeon. Asterisk cough asterisk cough it was quite unexpected for those two to have transportation scrolls on them. Adrian and Clement felt a chill run down their spines when they heard Maltz talking about his strange fetishes again. After being reborn, Maltz's sadistic fetish hadn't changed, but rather, its degree had entered a completely new level, having a hobby of taking human males and Fortunately, Maltz didn't have any interest in evil beings. Oh yeah, this zombie commander wants to seek asylum with our esteemed Demon King. He was summoned by the Demon King Bella herself, so I don't think there are any problems. No problem, but the Dark Sanctuary doesn't accept weaklings, unless. Lord Suzerains, I have an important piece of information that I am willing to provide. I just plead for my lords to put in a few good words for me to Her Majesty, the Demon King, so that I may be able to serve her with my life. This is an honor that I have been seeking for my entire life. This zombie commander was once a human after all, and he knew how this kind of thing worked. He knew that this was a great opportunity for him. Evil beings had their own aspirations, and most of them were to serve under a strong Demon King. Speak. If it's important enough, you don't even need to go through us. Esteemed Demon King will hire you herself. It's like this. In the forest here. Are you sure? There's really something like this. Clement, go and report to the evil army's supervisor, Midnight Witcha. Mercedes, and ask her for further instructions. Venerated demon gods and demon kings are still currently on an outing. Don't report this to them for now in case it ruins their mood. After hearing this zombie commander's report, Maltz and Adrian were surprised. If its words were to be believed, there was another mysterious and evil power hidden away in this forest. The Dark Sanctuary's evil suzerains were dead set on eliminating this other force as different evil forces would often fight amongst themselves. To find another evil realm, they had outstretched their hands into the territory of their respected demon kings. They felt that if they didn't retaliate immediately, they would be ashamed to call themselves Demon King Bella's subordinates. Bella was still attending to something else that was quite interesting. So while Bella still didn't have a clue, her subordinates had already planned to start a war in her name. No one knew that the largest border conflict between evil forces to take place in the history of the Coristal Continent was about to begin. Underscore 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 back to the river head. Bella was using a blade with serrated sides to dissect the deep dot sea serpent's corpse while Chris sat beside her, occasionally conversing. Chris and Bella had already exchanged information about themselves, not mentioning the fact that they were transmigrators, of course. Bella also didn't mention that she was a demon king while Chris had even told Bella her identity as a hero. From the fact that Chris was so unnaturally interested in the underwear that she had designed, Bella could almost completely confirm that Chris was a transmigrator. She also purposely shifted the topic to clothes and fashion. Chris didn't suspect anything and didn't hide her true opinions during the conversation. After they talked for a while, Bella was finally at ease. Based on the conversations in her previous life, as a fashion designer, with female models as well as the various female-oriented topics that they had discussed, Bella could basically confirm that Chris was a female in her past life as well. Fortunately, Chris was a girl before. If she was like Bella. 
it would have been rather awkward as they were still conversing in the nude. As her train of thought reached here, a shiver ran down Bella's back. It wasn't that she had something against males as she was one before she had come to this world. It was just that even though her gender was changed after the transmigration, her sexual orientation had not. Maybe because she trusted Bella, Chris didn't hesitate to give Bella a demonstration of her cheats. She gestured to the air in front of her with her right hand, and a door appeared seemingly out of nowhere. After opening the door, the sight inside shocked Bella to her core. The pseudo-dot-dimension within was much larger than what Bella had previously guessed, and it seemed as if the entire space was filled with swords. None of the swords in here were normal, and each one of them gave off a strong air and a different aura. Countless famous blades formed a giant sword formation. At the center were nine special swords that floated upright in the air. Seven of them were arrayed in the order of the seven compass stars, one. For the other two, one floated above and one floated below the other seven. The pure dot white blade above the seven dot star formation gave off a very strong holy and righteous aura. Bella guessed that it was a sword that had slain demons. The dark dot black blade below was completely different. It gave off a sinister and bloody aura. This was definitely a blade that had slain countless gods. Bella estimated that the seven swords in the middle were already on par with her twelve demon king blades, and the other two had already exceeded them. The current serrated blade in her hands, the bone cutter, was something that Chris had just randomly taken out from her collection, but it would definitely be one of the best blades on the Coristal continent. What Bella couldn't understand was that around half of Chris's blades clashed with her identity as a hero, giving off evil and bloody air, especially that dark dot black blade. It was definitely a weapon that belonged in the hands of an evil final dot boss. The hilts of the swords in there had been modified to better fit the slimmer hands of a female. Bella was able to infer that these swords weren't simply collected by Chris after defeating opponents. These swords were very likely all usable by Chris by herself. It was quite unthinkable that a hero would use so many evil weapons. Seeing the size of her collection, Bella had a suspicion that this wasn't the first alternate world that Chris had transmigrated to, and most likely, not the second or third either, or else, it would be hard to explain such a large collection of swords that could stand at the top echelons of weapons on the Coristal continent. Fortunately for Bella, Chris was a softy and didn't like too much publicity unlike some other certain types of MCs from light novels. If they had such a powerful cheat, they would have conquered the world long ago. Bella was also glad that she didn't have to fight Chris, at least for now. Chris's cheats were already levels above those of Leisha's. It was hard to be a villain these days. Each hero's cheats were stronger than the others. Bella sent her condolences to all the demon kings before her, having to fight with such cheaters all the time. Even now, Bella was questioning existence. She couldn't be sure if there were any heroes with cheats stronger than Chris. The only thing she could do right now was to find a way to make sure that Chris wouldn't end up as an enemy. Even if Chris couldn't become an ally, Bella was focused on making sure that she stayed neutral. TL Notes 1. The Big Dipper Volume 1 Chapter 21 The Hero and the Demon King Depart on an Adventure You Are Listening at NovelFull.audio Translator The Light, Is There Someone Else Here Chris? I can feel a lot of gazes on us. As soon as she had entered Chris's pseudo-dot-dimension, Bella could feel countless gazes focused on her and Chris but apart from them, there was only a large multitude of swords in this pseudo-dot-dimension. Is it that you can see the sword-dot-spirits Bella? Each of the swords in here has its own and unique spirit, in Sword Haven as long as these swords were once renowned, they'll automatically develop their own spirit. After further conversation with Chris and under her instruction, Bella was finally able to see what exactly a sword.spirit was, beside each blade was a faintly visible beauty that shimmered in and out of sight. These sword.spirits had only shown themselves to Bella with a command from Chris as before this, Bella could only feel their gazes. These sword.spirits were different from the ghosts that Bella had seen, even though they both had the same shimmery appearance. 
these sword dot spirits all had features that showed expression and intelligence, unlike the stiff and unchanging facial features of a ghost. There were at least 10,000 swords in Sword Haven. If each of them had their own spirits, Chris had at least 10,000 subordinates. What shocked Bella the most were the two blades that were situated at the top and bottom of the other seven central blades. The dark sword and the white sword spirits looked almost exactly the same, apart from their hair that reflected the color of their blades, Bella would definitely believe that these two were twins if she had seen them anywhere else. Bella was rather envious of Chris here, all of the sword dot spirits were beauties and seemed to be intelligent existences. All of the sword dot spirits' gazes were on Bella and Chris, those who looked at Chris were all filled with adoration, while of those that looked at Bella, half were curious and half were looking in awe. Those who looked in awe were mostly the spirits of the dark type swords. According to Chris' conversation with Bella, she would often spend her time training with these sword dot spirits in Sword Haven as she didn't really have any friends outside. Each and every sword dot spirit in here were able to wield their own body and fight, this along with the fact that time spent in Sword Haven barely took up any time outside, letting Chris train in here for as long as she wanted, made it hard for Chris to not improve her swordsmanship. Chris would summon a random blade for each battle and wouldn't use one of the nine special blades unless her opponent was unable to be defeated otherwise. As she used a different blade with different abilities each time, people were unable to get a feel for her combat style and after a while, people stopped coming to challenge this unpredictable hero. Oh yeah Chris, let's solve your clothing problem while we're discussing. Uh, can you tell me your three sizes? I can make you a set of underwear on the spot for now. Um, I haven't actually measured before. Oh, then would you mind if I use my hands to measure your sizes? No, go ahead. Underscore 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 outside the dark sanctuary's demon king hall, a massive number of evil beings had gathered and within the hall, several hundred dark suzerains had gathered within once again and kneeled with their faces that were filled with awe turned towards the twelve demon king thrones. There weren't any demon kings present, they were kneeling to someone else. Beside the A.Demon's Harda was a small lowly lazily stretching her arms as if she had just woken up from a good sleep. Above Thea.Devil's Wistoma was another lowly, sitting cross, legged in the air as if deep in thought. While the two lolas were small, the dark suzerains all looked at them in awe, because these two lolas were Thea.Demon's Harda. And they dot devils with Doma, their scents were all too familiar to the suzerain's present a dot demons harder. And they dot devils with Doma were only able to take the form of a human after meeting some very strict restrictions, mainly that they required that their owner and owner's subordinates possess a large amount of dark power. The only other time their human forms had appeared was in a dark creatura. Tracy Mystica's Dimension it was evident how powerful Bella and her subordinates were. I've already received the news, this is a matter that concerns the glory of Dark Sanctuary, we'll go with your suggestions as to what we do. Follow the command of the eyes. After she finished speaking, the lowly Basidia dot devils with Stoma. Stood up and extended her right hand towards the sky and gestured with it. In the sky above the Demon King Hall appeared a giant pair of eyeballs that seemed to have the very fires of hell burning within. After appearing, the two eyeballs moved around in the air as if they were alive. These devil's eyes were a type of evil being that was used as scouts to gather intel on enemy position and movements as well as providing non-combative aerial support to allied ground forces. I thank the two princess. Samus for your support. My colleagues, right now there is another evil force ready to make trouble in our territory, this is an affront to the Dark Sanctuary. Currently, the Demon Gods and Demon King. Samus are preoccupied and unable to deal with this, what should we do as their subordinates? You don't even need to ask, Mercedes. Sama, my colleagues, this is time for us to show our loyalty and dedication to the Dark Sanctuary. Seeing the explodingly high morale of the Dark Suzerains below, the two Lolas weren't very interested at all, they had only taken form to be able to see Bella and the other demon gods. As for this battle, they felt as if it was already in the bag, 
even though the opposing evil force would be a tough nut to crack, but as long as they finish creating those void monarchs, the battle's outcome would definitely end in the Dark Sanctuary's victory. Dot, hey heart, come and help me a bit, I want to create a few void monarchs. Are you sure that you want to create those void monarchs, brain? Nay dot Samus aren't present, isn't this? I'm not stupid like you, I asked Nay dot Sama for a few extra drops of blood when we were forming the contract, using Bella dot Nace blood, the void monarchs we create won't be of any problems. Because they will be created using Bella dot Nace blood, they'll all obey her commands. You're smart, I'll admit it this time, let's go. When Nay dot Samus get back they'll love this surprise we've prepared for them. Maybe Bella Nay dot Sama will even reward us with some pretty clothes. Dot. Underscore 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 Bella was currently unaware that someone had already steered the Dark Sanctuary into a war, even though the two Lolas didn't mean anything bad, but Bella preferred to not be left in the dark in such matters. After this, Bella set up a shift system for the Demon Kings of the Dark Sanctuary, so that there would always be at least one Demon King stationed at the Dark Sanctuary at any given time to supervise. It would be hard to implement this system right now, however, as there were only three Demon Kings currently. How is it Chris, does it fit well? It does, but this style. It's fine, you don't need to care about anything else. As long as it fits comfortably. The underwear that Chris was currently wearing was the one that Bella had personally created for her using the softest skin of the deep. Sea Serpent's Underbelly Bella chose a more sexy style while making it and the result was an elegant but scantily clad design that looked like Chris had black scales covering only her most private areas. Bella had referenced some of her earlier works for Dolores and that may have contributed to the small surface area covered. Bella looked satisfyingly at her creation, she felt that if she had used dragon leather instead, the aesthetic effect would have been better. What satisfied Bella the most, however, was that while she measured Chris, she had taken her time to feel her up, just thinking about how a demon king had tainted a hero sent a shiver of ecstasy down Bella's spine. Bella didn't tell Chris about the clothes that she had fished out of the water earlier, she planned to bring Chris back to where Nosha and the others were downstream and let Chris change into clothes that she had designed. Bella had a more selfish reason for doing this, the clothes that she designed all had a special resonance magic formation weaved in, even in the underwear. This resonance magic formation didn't do any harm so even if, by sheer chance, someone discovered it, most people wouldn't bother removing it. The only thing that this formation had was that those who had resonance magic formations on their clothes would be able to sense the other one they were within a certain radius of the other, but only if they knew how to use it of course. While she was in Sword Haven, Bella made short eye dot contact with a few sword dot spirits and from the gaze of the darkest blade in the center, Bella was able to see an event that happened in the past. For a split second, she was able to see Chris in black armor with twelve blood-colored energy wings spread behind her. She was swinging at the air in front of her wildly, wielding the demonic blade. Each time she slashed, a large blade of a Jian Xia flew out, the land in front of her was engulfed in a sea of flames as if Judgment Day had come. Around Chris were countless shimmering shadows, most likely her sword-spirits aiding her in battle. This definitely wasn't the past that a hero should have, Bella didn't expect Chris to have such a dark past, she just didn't know if Chris herself remembered this. If there was the possibility that Chris had destroyed a world before, they should be part of the same side, perhaps the two of them would be able to avoid a confrontation in the future. All of Chris' sword dot spirits were able to take human form and wield their own sword, letting the sword reach the extent of its abilities. If Chris wanted to, she could destroy this world with her 10,000 sword maidens alone. Bella didn't have too much time to think about this, it was possible that she may have discovered something more interesting had she stayed in Sword Haven for a while longer. With Bella's instruction, the Deep Dot Sea Serpent's corpse had been transported by zombies to where No Sha and the others were downstream after Bella and Chris had left. What Bella thought was strange was that Tamper who had been following her previously had disappeared, something probably came up back at the Dark Sanctuary, Bella guessed. 
While the two girls traveled downstream, they didn't see a single zombie, as the zombies that Bella summoned earlier had already retreated out of sight and keep watch on their surroundings. Nay.sama, you're back. We had thought that you fell into the water with how long you had been gone. Who is this beautiful sister? Chris. Why are you here? Ivy immediately recognized Chris, a former friend. This was the first time in a while that Chris had seen so many strangers, out of shyness she hid behind Bella, one hand holding on to Bella's. Seeing the sheepish Chris, if Bella hadn't seen her, cheats firsthand, it was hard to connect this girl with her identity as a hero. After exchanging introductions with the other girls, Chris temporarily joined Bella's adventuring party to Ivy's surprise, her impression of Chris in the past three years was that of an introvert and a loner. But the current Chris shyness completely threw Ivy's impression of her out the window, Ivy needed some time to get used to this Chris. As they were all beautiful girls, Chris was easily able to fit in with the others. Apart from being rather scared to communicate with Ivy and Susan, she was quickly able to make conversation with Dolores, Eleanor, and the other girls that she had just met. It was probably only around Bella where a demon king was able to converse peacefully with a hero. Towards Chris, Angel, and Mia didn't show any hostility, their eyes showed their curiosity towards Chris. Nay.sama, Chris.ne has the scent of an enemy, but also that of an ally. You might want to pay more attention to her, she might be able to join our side. Nosha, do you know why she is like this? Seeing Nosha run away with a trickster's grin on her face, Bella was annoyed at how the lowly ran off before clarifying what she had been talking about. If there weren't other girls here and Bella had to preserve her good impression, Bella would have grabbed some rope and educated Nosha on why she shouldn't leave Bella hanging. Bella's party was still currently relaxing in the water, after Bella had left earlier, Nosha and the others dug a half-meter deep pool beside the stream and then diverted some of its water into the pool to create this artificial pool. They had just finished when Bella returned so Bella had very fortunately not missed the service of bathing with the beauties. The serpent's body had been carried here by zombies long ago, although this serpent looked terrifying, its entire body was a treasure. Its meat alone was a rare delicacy as water-dwelling monsters were harder to catch than their land. Dwelling counterparts, the price of a water-dwelling monster was much higher, equal to that of flying monsters. Apart from the serpent's meat, the poison was also very useful, if it needed to be. After finishing their shower, Roland and Annie helped set up a fire while Eleanor prepped the meat. It was easy to leave this kind of stuff to them as all three of them had wilderness experience while Mia and Angel were responsible for collecting everything of use from the serpent's body. As there weren't any outsiders here, the girls only wore their underwear to prevent from getting their change of clothes dirty. While Bella listened to Ivy briefing them about ground dragons, she enjoyed the forest scenery. Ground dragons, as a pseudo-dragon, didn't have wings but were had the signature tough scales of dragons that were undamageable by normal weapons. While they couldn't cast any magic, ground dragons were able to use their body's natural magic, such as its fire breath. Killing monsters was quite different from hunting them, killing was much simpler as all you had to do was kill the monster and didn't have to care about anything else. Hunting a monster required to keep the body and magic core as intact as possible, making monster hunting not very suitable for high damage classes such as mages as they would damage the monster's body too much. Because of this, Bella purposely brought Annie who was an archer. While hunting monsters, assassins, archers and other classes who were able to deliver a fatal blow with a relatively small wound was high in demand. Bella currently didn't have any assassins so she had to make do with only an archer. As for weapons, Bella didn't have any weapon designed for dragon dot slaying but with the addition of Chris, they would be able to utilize the countless blades within Sword Haven that definitely carried a few for dragon dot slaying. Hey Ivy, why do you need a core? You don't seem like the type that lacks money, you're not a magic user that needs it either. Susan's light magic doesn't specifically need this core, there are a lot of lower level monsters whose cores would work much better for her. Actually Bella, it isn't me that needs the magic core, it's the school's entrance assessment that requires it. 
Volume 1 Chapter 22 In the midst of ground dragon hunting you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator The light deep within the unnamed forest, a small party of adventurers had encircled a giant, earth bear, and were engaged in combat. Earth bears, were classified as a C.class monster by the Adventurers Guild, it was a fierce earth.type monster that could use several earth-type magic. Most adventuring parties would walk the other way as soon as they came into sight of one, because, earth bears, were quick to anger and could enter a berserk state during which its attack power could reach the level of a B.class monster. But currently, this, earth bear, that towered at around 3 meters in height was being beat into submission by an adventuring party comprised of only 11 girls, four of which were knights, two swordswomen, an archer, a cleric, and what seemed to be three little priestesses just standing around and providing moral support. If there was a pill to undo an action that one regretted, this, earth bear, really wanted one. It found its way into this mess because it couldn't resist the fragrant scent of the roasting, deep dot sea serpent and had come out of its den to forage for food, but quickly regretted it. Even though the adventuring party was small and completely made of girls, the Earth Bear would have picked a larger adventuring party to fight any day, as long as it didn't have to face this party. The knights of this party were like unmoving steel walls that had boxed it in. The Earth Bear was completely unable to escape the encirclement, Every time it tried, the knight in whichever direction it tried to break through was able to use their shields to block its path. The furious, earth bear, swung its massive paws against the knight's shields to no avail, no matter how much strength it put into its strikes, it couldn't break through the knight's defensive stances, not even moving them from their spot. The two swordswomen hid behind the cover of the knights looking for their opportunity to strike, whenever the, earth bear, began an assault on one of the knights, the swordswomen would take advantage of the gap in its defenses to strike. While the black-dot-haired swordswoman wasn't much of a threat, the silver-dot-haired swordswoman was able to strike six to nine times in the blink of an eye, and her sword was unusually sharp, each of her strikes was able to pierce through the bear's thick skin and draw out large amounts of blood. Even the magic attacks of the earth bear, magic attacks were suppressed by the adventurers, Whenever it began charging up its magic, the party's archer was always able to accurately place arrows so that it would be forced to stop charging magic unless it wanted to trade its life. The female cleric kept buffing the four knights, further shifting the balance in their favor, this was no longer a battle, this was completely one-dot-sided abuse. Of course, Bella wouldn't care about the thoughts happening within the thick skull of the earth bear, she was enjoying the process of this battle. Previously, she had let her subordinate dark suzerains take the reign in the slaughter of monsters in this area, not giving Bella and the others chance to show their abilities. When faced with a swarm of dark suzerains, even A.class monsters would be unable to escape death, while S.class monsters could only run for their lives before they got swarmed. The current Bella was experiencing a strange sort of pleasure that even playing Monster Hunter VR on Earth hadn't given her. It was quite easy to get passionate when fighting such a large monster that she knew couldn't hurt her. As the party didn't have any high dot damaging range units like mages, Bella and the others were engaged in melee with the earth bear, and each time it struck her shield, Bella was able to feel the shock traveling from the shield. Every time the earth bear charged, it was repelled easily by the knights. It had also entered berserk state several times already, but even while under berserk status, its power that had been multiplied several times was still unable to budge the female knights in front of it, they even conversed with each other with smiles on their face. I've had enough. If you all are so fierce, why don't you go and fight an S.class monster, instead of bullying my C.class ass? With a roar, the Earth Bear entered berserk state again, this was its final surge. Its body had already reached its limit and even if Bella and the others didn't attack, it would collapse soon enough. Right at this moment, Annie sent an arrow through the eye of the Earth Bear, piercing through its skull. The Earth Bear was immediately silenced and collapsed like a ragdoll to the ground with its mouth open as if complaining to the heavens about the unfairness of life. 
From the beginning, it didn't have any chance to survive, Annie's first arrow would have been able to pierce its skull, the only reason why she didn't was to let Bella and the other close-ranged members of the party practice and improve their cohesion. The berserk state of the Earth Bear was a joke to Bella and the others, not even being able to budge an unmoving knight. After felling the giant, Earth Bear, Angel and Mia went up to harvest, due to Ivy and Susan's presence they were currently only able to do miscellaneous work. Ivy and Susan looked at Bella and the other knights emotionally, each monster hunting group's priority was having a strong knight. If the knight wasn't strong enough and wasn't able to block the attacks of the monster, the rest of the party would be in danger. Many groups of monster hunters had been slaughtered because their knights had been killed before the party managed to severely damage the monster. Although Bella, Eleanor, Dolores, and Roland didn't carry the mark of a holy knight, Susan estimated that their abilities were definitely higher than that of a normal holy knight. Normal human knights would use Do Chi that they gained through their cultivation to help supplement their defenses but Bella and the others hadn't used any during their fight with the Earth Bear, meaning that they had repelled attacks of what was effectively a B. Class monster with their own strength. Susan wondered how much strength and endurance it would take to directly defend against a C.class monster that was renowned for its strength. So far, this Earth Bear was the one that had lasted the longest. All the other C.class monsters that they had ran into didn't last more than a couple slashes from Chris. All this party needed right now was a good assassin and it would be perfect, although Annie had talent in the field of archery, she was like Roland in that they still had human bodies that would still get tired in long fights. In the fight previously, Roland actually wouldn't have lasted that long. It was just that every time the Earth Bear attacked Roland, no Shah secretly used time magic to slow it down, causing the force behind its strikes to largely decrease. It seems that Bella needed to have a talk with Roland and Annie, each demon king was able to bestow power on an exclusive maidservant whose power would skyrocket until it reached about 60% of the demon kings who bestowed power on her. As the demon king's power increases, the power of the exclusive maidservant will as well. This was much better than the power that demon kings bestowed to their subordinate evil beings, as if evil beings wanted to get more power than that was bestowed on them initially, they must have enough achievements and merit needed for that amount of power. While the exclusive maidservant only needed to receive power from her demon king once and then their power would be able to keep growing without interference from the demon king. Bella was currently trying to formulate a plan that would be able to make it so that Chris wouldn't be on her opposing side in the future, according to Nosha, Chris had a chance of darkening, one. Should Bella make Chris darken so that she can no longer be a savior? This wasn't the best choice and had a lot of uncertainties, Bella wasn't sure how likely she would be able to beat Dark Chris if they came to odds. The current Chris seemed to love the clothes that Bella designed for her, this might be something that could be useful in the future, it wouldn't hurt to build up a good relationship first, Bella decided. The party continued on their journey, perhaps it was because of how loud the death cry of the Earth Bear was, Bella and the others didn't run into any more monsters on the way. Underscore 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 not long after Bella's party left the area, another party of adventurers soon reached the area. This party numbered in the hundreds with many cavalry mixed within. They were led by a female knight with a tall figure and golden locks, her features looked similar to that of Philia and Leisha, but it seemed that she was slightly older than those two and gave off a more mature air. Octavio Irene, first princess of the Octavian Empire, knights, first of the four royal beauty holy knights, with Philia, Leisha before becoming a dragon knight, and the third princess, Octavio Luce, making up the other three. Irene had come to the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, this time to hunt, ground dragons. The feelings in Irene's heart were complicated, too much had happened in the past few months. First was Philia being sent to survey the Alfred continent but then disappearing and was probably dead, then Leisha's anti-demon knight corp was heavily hit by an explosion caused by evil beings, while Leisha and the other heroes that followed her were fine, she seemed to have taken quite the mental blow after. No matter how humble Philia and Leisha's origins were, they were still my little sisters. Right now, Irene was regretting how she avoided Philia and Leisha in the past because she was afraid of people gossiping about them together. 
Now that one was missing and the other was low dot spirited and not willing to see her, the only person remaining in the royal palace that Irene could confide in was the third princess, Octavio Luce. Dot however, Luce's body hasn't been very well recently, she had been too careless while killing a necromancer a year ago and had been hit with the necromancer's rebound magic, withered Lithia. Luce was now too weak to even leave the bed, Irene didn't want to lose this last little sister of hers, after hearing that the heart of a, ground dragon, was able to expel a necromancer's magic, she had come to the unnamed forest to try her luck. At the Adventurer's Guild, ground dragons were always a dot class at the very least and most large dot-sized adventurer parties were afraid to mess with any. Originally, Irene had wanted to invite Chris to help but after she arrived in the Gabriel Empire, swordsman, the Empire's Prince Leonard and Noble Edwin told her with frightened faces that they didn't know where Chris was. Seeing the two with their faces pale from fear and their stuttering speech, Irene hurried here as soon as she managed to hear where Chris was seen last. As the fighting between humans and beast men had escalated, most mercenaries in this area had left as there was no longer any lords in the area to hire them or were scared off by the beast men, forcing Irene to bring her own personal guards with her. On her way, Irene saw many monsters who had been brutally killed, from the footprints it seemed that there were only about eleven adventurers in the party that had killed them, there were no signs of magic on the corpses, meaning that the party who had killed all these monsters had done it with brute strength alone and that these adventurers should be pretty strong. She further reaffirmed her thought after seeing the body of the earth bear, which was a rather well. Known monster in these parts, the ability of the party who took it down was undeniable. Irene right now just wanted to hurry and catch up to this mysterious party of adventurers and see if she could acquire their assistance. Underscore 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 Bella and the others didn't know that they were being trailed, Angel couldn't use her powers as there were no spirits nearby, Tamper had gone God knows where. The usual methods that Bella relied on for intel on the surrounding environments were gone. Bella was confident, however, as Chris was currently part of her party, even if they ran into Leisha's party, Bella believed that her party would be able to go toe dot to dot toe with them. Underscore 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 the zombies that Bella had summoned earlier had all disappeared and Irene's party didn't encounter them, they had been summoned by several mysterious figures in grey robes using a normal undead summoning magic. On an empty field somewhere deep within the forest, a large number of zombies were gathering. A group of grey dot robed figures were surrounding a strange magic formation, they seemed to be summoning undead. Seeing the swarm of zombies heading their way, these mysterious figures were unnaturally excited and didn't discover that many of the zombies coming towards them were those that had been summoned by Bella earlier. The zombie commander that Bella summoned had pretended to be responding to the mysterious figure's summons, it was highly intelligent as it had been initially summoned with some essences from a dot devil's wistoma. And if it wanted, it wouldn't have been summoned by such low dot level magic. However, this zombie commander had been taking lessons from a master of Fasisa. Clement and had learned several things from him, insidiousness being one of them. Seeing that there was someone performing this magic, it had brought its subordinates with it and pretended to be controlled. Seeing the prideful summoners in front of the magic formation, the zombie commander decided to wait a little while longer, its subordinates were stealthily nailing, corpse controlling nails on the other zombies, it wouldn't be long before all the other zombies would jump ship and become puppets of the zombie commander. All that it needed to do now was quietly follow these summoners until they reached a place with many big chests. Then would be the time to end them then take the chests and tribute them to Demon King. Sama, then it would be able to receive more power and start its path to the pinnacle of an evil being. The summoners didn't notice this strange existence at all, it was unheard of for such an intelligent evil being to be summoned with such a low dot level spell. Underscore 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 it was very easy to track, ground dragons, Bella realized that all she had to do was follow the strange and giant footprints and eventually they would lead her to the, ground dragon. Within the adventurer guild, ground dragons, were rated a dot class as they were pseudo dot dragons with high physical attack and defense, the magic core of a, ground dragon, had only appeared on the market three times in the past, and even those belonged to juveniles, there was no information of anyone seeming to have killed an adult, ground dragon. The, ground dragon, 
that Bella was tracking wasn't too far from the center of the unnamed forest, it might have been forced out by a monster stronger than the ground dragon, and had either been outcompete, forced to go elsewhere for food, or it was no match for the other monster and had fled for its life. At their destination, Bella finally saw their target for this expedition, a group of ground dragons. Looking at the group of what seemed to be eight meters long, enlarged monitor lizards, Bella was a little speechless, the intel that they had gathered previously said that, ground dragons, were solitary animals, but now they had run into an entire group of them. If they had to fight all these, ground dragons, their party size was definitely not enough, unless they disregarded Susan and Ivy and show their demon king abilities but even then they might need to call for some dark suzerains and their subordinates to come and aid them. TL notes, 1, darkening, a, dot a, is a righteous character becoming evil, can't find a better word for it. Volume 1 Chapter 23 Family you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator The light ivy needed the magic core of a, ground dragon, because it was only a month until the various academies of the Coristal Continent opened their doors for new students. Ivy was planning to sign up for the number one academy on the continent, the Alcivia Academy, the academy was split into five campuses. East, West, South, North, and Central. The East Campus for those who had outstanding talent, West for those of royal birth, South for members of the clergy, North for those of noble birth, while the Central Campus was for those of common birth. Normally Ivy would have entered the North Campus due to her birth but she had wanted to transfer to the East Campus. Students of the East Campus were exempt from their family's control and obligations while they still attended the academy due to them being considered exceptional. What Ivy wanted was just that, in the recent years the adults of her family had been considering a political marriage with another big family, if she didn't act now, she was very likely to be married off as a political pawn. The East Campus was exceptionally hard and Ivy's movements had been watched by her family, the teacher in charge of assessments had some relation to her family and had purposely given her an extra hard task to scare her away from the East Campus. The other students who had applied for the East Campus were at most assigned to hunt monsters like Earth Bears and other C. Class monsters, it was easy to see how unfair it was that Ivy was assigned a. Class monster, Ground Dragon. After hearing about the unfair treatment that Ivy received, Bella was furious. She had already made a backup plan in case they failed in Ground Dragon hunting. It was to find a way to pull Ivy to her side as there were still nine empty thrones in the Dark Sanctuary's Demon King Hall, even if Ivy's power was inadequate to inherit one of the thrones, there were other positions that Bella could give her. In front of them, there was an entire herd of ground dragons, and Bella figured that it was very likely that they wouldn't be able to succeed but she didn't want to give up before even trying so she had gathered the party's members to discuss their next course of action. Chris can you break through the defenses of a ground dragon? I can but. With so many of them, as soon as we attack one the rest will probably swarm us and that'll be quite troublesome. Nay dot sama, why does it have to be us that fight the ground dragons? There seems to be a more powerful monster within these forests, we could lure it into the ground dragon, herd and we just secretly wait on the side while they fight. Noesha's words enlightened everyone, this plan was usable, though risky. If they accidentally brought back something too strong, those who acted as bait could be in danger. To be cautious, Bella decided that only Chris and herself would lure out the other monster while the rest of the party remained here and kept an eye on the ground dragons. Apart from Susan and Ivy, the other members of the party didn't have any problems with Bella's decision, most likely because they knew her true power. After Chris confirming that she had no problems as well, Susan and Ivy finally gave their approval for Bella's plan. Underscore underscore underscore, you really do have a dragon dot slaying blade, Chris. Seeing the strange pale white sword in Chris' hand, Bella was rather envious of Chris' cheats, if only they were able to exchange. Chris was currently wielding Dragon's Elegy, a sword that had slain countless dragons, previously wielded by dragon killer Arnold, a hero renowned for the number of dragons that he slew. 
His final battle was a terrifyingly powerful demon king who had effortlessly cut him down with a standard issue steel blade. Chris casually introduced the sword's origin, the more that Bella heard the more suspicious she got. Chris knew a little too much about the sword, being able to remember minute details like how many strikes it took for the demon king to cut down the hero. After knowing that Chris may have a dark side, Bella suspected that Chris herself may have been the terrifyingly powerful demon king that slew Arnold, she might just not have remembered it herself. Dot as there were only two of them, Chris was a lot more open dot minded, probably because Bella already knew about her cheat. As they had no support or any way of pinpointing any monsters, the two of them traveled towards the center of the unnamed forest, light novel MCs almost always find high dot level monsters the first time they traveled into the central regions of a forest, so Bella and Chris decided to give the old gimmick a shot. Underscore 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 in another part of the forest, a river of blood was being shed. The party that Octavio Irene had led into the forest had been ambushed and encircled by zombies. Even though the average member of the party was stronger than that of Leonard's party previously, as they also had not brought any clerics with them, it was hard for them to escape their fate. While Irene was a holy knight, there were several necromancers on the other side casting dark magic on her party which didn't have any clerics to fight back with and it didn't take very long for all her subordinates to die. Irene had managed to hold out till now with her holy knight's Do Chi, her armor had been damaged beyond repair and the necromancer's corpse poison had already seeped into several of her wounds, causing her to feel unbearable pain. The zombies encircling Irene weren't giving it all, she had figured this out long ago. These zombies moved with extra dot wide motions that covered much of the field of view for the zombies and necromancers behind them. If these zombies had worked like they did on her subordinates, Irene would have perished long ago. Bella's zombie commander had been secretly giving commands to its subordinates who were encircling Irene and had purposely made them not kill her. As a rather intelligent monster, it was able to recognize that Irene shared a lot of physical features with Demon King Bella. Sama, who had summoned it, the two were very likely related by blood. Even if the two of them weren't relatives, there were credible rumors spreading within the Dark Sanctuary's upper echelons that Bella. Sama had a taste for females, if it brought back such a beauty for her, Bella. Sama would definitely reward it more than if it had only brought back some treasures. The zombie commander sneaked a glance towards the altar not too far from it where the grey dot robed necromancers were still laughing sinisterly, probably something related to the treatment of the beauty knight as they were eyeing her up with strange gazes. These pretentious humans, I'll send them up to their maker soon enough, the millennia of zombies being controlled by necromancers ends today. He he, I didn't expect to be able to find such appetizing prey here, Without those bastards from the Church of Light, our subordinates can deal with these holy knights with ease. The Church of Light has fought with our Church of Darkness for so long and had always held the upper hand, these holy knights were their biggest accomplice. If it wasn't for the Church of Light Salo faction secretly providing us with intel, we would have been eradicated long ago. This beauty seems to be barely an adult, let's turn her into a zombie knight. It's our chance now as the unholy maiden isn't here. The necromancers conversed openly, completely unaware that a zombie behind them was currently recording everything that they said onto a piece of paper, they were also unaware that several zombies were stealthily making their way towards them. Irene was finally unable to stand and drop to a knee while forcefully propping herself up with her sword. This pose was the same one that Philia had died in just a few months ago, but Irene would prove to be more fortunate than her late sister. Seeing that Irene was no longer to resist, the front row of the encircling zombies stopped their movements, blocking the way of the zombies behind them who couldn't do anything about it. This was the difference between intelligent zombies and those who weren't, zombies without intellect wouldn't attack their peers while the intelligent ones who were currently blocking them would. If their commander ever gave the order, they would cut down their peers behind them without hesitation. What's wrong, these zombies aren't responding to commands. Hurry up and attack, bring me that knight's head, the necromancers were about to give the command for the zombies to continue the attack but were cut short by two figures rushing their way, a swordswoman and a female knight. 
The swordswoman with flowing silver hair waved the golden sword in her hand and the zombies nearest to her were instantly cut into pieces. What was stranger was that quite a few zombies had run away from the two girls as soon as they had shown themselves. On their way, they purposely tripped and ran over the zombies who didn't run. The densely dot-packed defense line formed by zombies had an opening forcefully made by the traitor zombies, letting the two girls reach the altar where the necromancers were with relatively little trouble. Quickly Jimmy, summon skeletons, there is something wrong with these zombies, we. A necromancer was just about to turn around when a zombie not too far behind him pounced him and bear hunt him from behind, its dirty hands firmly clasped over the necromancer's mouth, stopping him from chanting any spells. Right after, the zombie forcefully twisted its arms, breaking the necromancer's neck. As the necromancer fell to the ground his eyes were open wide as if he still hadn't understood why or how a zombie that he had summoned was the one that killed him. Seeing the death of their companion, the remaining necromancers quickly activated flight magic to take to skies and assess the situation. Right as they got off the ground, several zombies grabbed them by their ankles and pulled them to the ground. Zombies had strength far exceeding that of humans while necromancers were absolute rubbish at close range, they were destined to be no match for zombies in a melee. As soon as the necromancers hit the ground, they were swarmed by zombies who used their various weapons to fiercely stab at the grounded necromancers. From a distance, Bella watched the necromancers being stabbed to death without surprise as she was able to recognize that over half of these zombies were those that were summoned by her previously but were gathered by those death-seeking necromancers. She and Chris had originally planned to travel deeper into the forest to lure stronger monsters but had run into the large mass of zombies. Bella recognized the banner flying over the encircled humans, it was that of the Octavian Empire, Knights, even though Philia was already considered dead to the Empire, it was still the homeland of Philia and her feelings had influenced Bella ever since Bella had taken her body. After seeing that the zombies had retreated, Chris didn't pursue them and swapped the darkness torment in her hands for the dragon's elegy once again. Around Bella, Chris was able to switch swords without care or worry. While alone, she had been afraid of exposing herself during fights with others so had to use the same sword from start to finish. Besides Bella, Chris didn't have such worries. In her opinion, the two of them had already seen each other's true self back at the river head and there was nothing more to hide from each other. Gradually, Chris learned to like being around Bella, where she didn't need to disguise herself anymore. She had already decided that she would find an excuse to stay beside Bella, it was just that she hadn't had the opportunity to speak to Bella yet. Bella right now didn't know anything about Chris' thoughts, she had walked up to the female knight that was surrounded by zombies earlier and looked at the beauty knight. This female knight with tall stature and golden hair was the first princess of the Octavian Empire, knights, and first of the for royal beauty holy knights, Octavio Irene, the older sister of Bella's substitute, Philia. Irene was the strongest among the four princess knights but had her spot as dragon knight stolen by Leisha who had gotten cheats out of nowhere. In Bella's memory, while Irene didn't interact much with Philia, but at least she didn't regard Philia with disdain. As sisters, secretly she was actually really caring towards Philia. The princesses of the empire had to be more mature than normal girls their age as their unscrupulous father had already pawned off all their sisters of marrying age in political marriages, leaving behind only the four princesses with the cultivation of holy knight. The four sisters were all holy knights and they would definitely bring a higher price than the other princesses with low cultivation, Octavio XII was waiting for suitable buyers to sell off his remaining daughters to. Irene knew what her father was planning but couldn't do anything about it as according to the Octavian Empire's, knights, traditions, holy knights still had to follow the emperor's commands while dragon knights had a little more freedom as the emperor couldn't force dragon knights to do something that they didn't want to, unless the empire would fall if they didn't. Clearly political marriage didn't fall under something that would cause the fall of the empire. All was well until Leisha suddenly came out of nowhere and stole her rightful position of dragon knight. After the competition, Philia wasn't the only one depressed, Irene was also depressed for quite a while. 
After all, Irene and Luce were of legitimate descent and there was already an estrangement between them and their little sisters Felia and Leisha, who were of illegitimate birth. Irene was quite angry after Leisha had taken what would have belonged to her. While Felia hadn't even finished the fight before Leisha was prematurely judged to be the winner after showing off her ability in magic but at the very least she had gotten to fight. While Irene hadn't even arrived on the fighting field before being told that Leisha had already won and the other contestants were automatically disqualified. This had struck a hard blow to Irene as at this time Leisha still had not formed a contract with the Golden Dragon, and her combat abilities were at the most equal to that of Felia's. If they were to seriously fight, Leisha at the time was definitely unable to beat Irene. After this, Irene completely strayed away from Leisha, and as Felia was an illegitimate daughter just like Leisha, she also became someone that Irene despised, even though Felia hadn't actually done anything to warrant her despise. The relationship between the four sisters had been broken, with Luce unconsciously avoiding Felia and Leisha under Irene's influence. Every time she thought about this, Bella cried out for the injustice dealt to her substitute, Felia. It was all that girl, Leisha's fault, yet Felia also got dragged into it simply because she shared the common trait of being an illegitimate daughter. After returning from the memories, Bella carefully studied Irene, Irene was the first girl taller than Bella that she had met in this world. If Felia's memories were correct, Irene was only around a year over than Felia, meaning that she was only nearing the age of 18. If they were on Earth, Irene had still not yet reached adulthood. Something that Bella had to mention was that amongst all the girls that Bella had seen, Irene was the one that most fitted the description of a female holy knight. Bella felt pangs of heartache as she looked at Irene who looked like a war goddess but was half dot kneeled on the ground. You are. Little Philia. Is this the afterlife? To be able to see you again. Irene opened her heavy eyelids and turned her sky blue irises towards Bella, recognizing her identity even though her consciousness was flickering. Irene. Nay, it's me, are you okay? This isn't the afterlife. Little Philia, I, never mind, it's a blessing that you're alright, it's a shame that I can't accompany. Bella hurried beside Irene and gently covered her mouth to prevent her from finishing her sentence. She wasn't going to give Irene the chance to raise a flag and get herself killed. The current Irene looked so similar to when Felia was dying, Bella wasn't going to let history repeat itself.